Hey everyone, Matt Lanford here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Primary and Secondary Podcast. This is episode 155. We're kind of carrying on the discussion that we had from last week. This week, we're going to be talking about incorporating EDC, everyday carry, into competition. So basically, the, the idea is refining your skills with your everyday carry with competition, and then also vice versa. How is this affecting your competition by using this versus using standard competition gear? Um, my background is uh, primarily law enforcement, a little bit of competition. I enjoy competition. It's fun. I understand I'm, I'm a rarity when it comes to that because cops typically don't like to be outshot because we typically are. Um, let's see here. A uh, big thank you to Facts on Firearms. Uh, if you go to factsonfirearms.com, you can find all kinds of really nice barrels, AR-15 barrels, pistol barrels, AR-15 parts. If you're looking for some, some options for your next build, check them out. Um, also, a big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. If you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can help support the entire network. These guys are doing it. These guys are helping us out and uh, ensuring that not only the, do the podcasts occur, do, but they also continue. And they're on all these different channels. Um, we have a ton of resources for your use, and it would not be possible without the Patreon support. Speaking of that Patreon support, we do have, let's see here, we have two giveaways going on. Uh, we have an 870, a used police 870 short barrel shotgun giveaway. As soon as we reach 700 Patreon subscribers, I'm giving one of those, I'm giving one of those shotguns away. The way it works is if you happen to live in an area that does not allow such a thing, we'll find something to replace it. If you, let's see here. Yeah, we, we did have one person win. Essentially, what he what, what, what he needs to do now is he's paying that tax stamp. We send the uh, shotgun off to his FFL person who deals with that. Uh, we also are doing a giveaway for the Friends of Pat. Because of my employment situation, I can't make Friends of Pat this year. And so I figured instead of trying to get a refund or anything like that, I'm going to give it to my Patreon subscribers. So I have... The Friends of Pat giveaway for our Patreon subscribers of $5 or more. I'm going to be closing that up probably next Wednesday and do the drawing shortly thereafter. I might even do that during the next episode. Um, speaking of the podcast, we will be changing up the schedule. For right now, my work schedule does allow us to remain on Thursdays at 1,800 hours, though today did start a little later. Um, expect the same quality. Expect the same the same uh, same quality in, uh, information and and discussion. I, I really like these, so I want to keep them going. So even if, if, if I'm on Graves and we're doing these at three in the morning, it's going to be good. I don't think that's going to be the case. So let's go to the panel and start pestering these poor guys. Let's start with Adam, because I just saw he looked at the camera. Yeah, no, I'm actually live streaming as well, just for the boredom. But Adam Peeney, I'm with Knights Element Company. Um, been in the firearms industry for over a decade. Uh, carry a handgun every day. Um, just started shooting appendix and uh, have been lucky to have very influential teachers in my life, Scott being one of them. Um, slowly learning how to apply that to uh, competition and the couple of USPSAs and we have in Florida called uh, Florida Defensive Carbine Course which is a two-gun match, so they allow us to run uh, appendix there. So it's uh, it, it's been a huge learning curve, but something that is a good challenge and something that I think crosses over. So, yeah, that's me. I'm, I'm a nobody at the end of the day. That we all know and love. My dog's super pissed, by the way. He's like, why aren't you paying attention to me? <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, John. <laughs> so... Um, John Dufresne uh, with Sage Dynamics and also Kinetic Consulting. Um, I'm a former Army Ranger. I uh, used to do some work. Now I just do some teaching. Uh, I do a lot of consulting for law enforcement, federal agencies down here, um, and also teach civilian classes. So look at them, look them up. Uh, also known as Mocha Bear. And some people still remember when I called myself a unicorn. So I still get unicorns sometimes. <laughs> Hell yeah. But yeah, man. Yeah. Just love love things. 
Uh, real quick before Gabe and Les hop on, uh, Gabe um, and Les, these guys, you know, uh, these tactical Timmies here may not know who you guys are. Do not, I know, I know, do not uh, take out any accolades, all right? Put, throw all the things you've accomplished in there, please. Oh, yeah, yeah. Continue. Oh, before we go there, Scott. You but, probably need to do your intro. Oh, you want me to do my part of these guys? Okay. So yeah. these dudes already know me. Uh, so uh, Scott Jadlinski, um, I run Modern Samurai Project, uh, teach some classes on Red Dot Pistol and AIWB kind of as a primer before you go to an Ernest Langdon class or a uh, Gabe White class so you don't get your souls don't get crushed. That said, uh, lifelong martial artist, non-mill, non-LE, um, then a couple of things. Uh, I have owned number 15, uh, fast coin only got to do it with an RMR and I am a master class shooter in carry optics. Cheater. That's exactly. Oh, exactly. Who cheats? <laughs> who cheats? Who cheats? I yeah, thought cheat. I was on mute. Hey, I'll, but, yeah. yeah, it's all Oops. right. It's all right. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll edit that in post. Yeah. Um, Gabe, go ahead. Well, my name is Gabriel White. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I'm just a, I'm a private citizen. I uh, know military or law enforcement experience, but uh, from the time I've been a little kid, I've always been interested in the martial arts and self-defense, and I've always been studying or practicing something throughout my life, whatever that was at the time. And the last, uh, now about 20 years or so, it's been defensive firearm skills and tactics, most especially with the handgun. Uh, I'm a multiple graduate of uh, schools, uh, regional handgun schools regionally, I've got about, you know, 800 or 1000 hours of formal of time in formal training and a whole lot more than that in informal uh, organized practice and and, and self practice. Um, as is the, you know, very common pattern, if you're a very serious student in schools like that, you'll get abducted to be a volunteer instructor at some point. And, you know, I kind of came up through a dual apprenticeship under people who do have a lot of experience uh, at those places uh, that I that I trained the most at. And I've trained with other other schools as well, uh, but uh, uh, as I've as I've come up, I've also you know eventually became hired uh, at uh, one of the sheriff's offices locally uh, as as a, a range training officer. And as I'm not a law enforcement officer, that's not a sworn position. We have a real odd situation there, which yeah, a fantastic situation where we have a a, a range facility uh, run by a county sheriff's office in the area that has not just your typical concealed carry class that's going to be you know a few hours long and non-firing and just you know uh, satisfy the state requirements but a whole comprehensive training program uh put in play about a about a 90-hour training program open to private vetted private citizens in defensive handgun use um, that was put in place by my primary mentor who is he's, he's not somebody who wants to be named especially but he has a very storied career ranging from vietnam to a whole uh, career in california law enforcement and uh, he put this program in place and it, the, the program is uh, it's reasonably hard in the in the self-defense training world uh it's you know they actually have timers and scored targets and stuff and you you know you have to it's sink or swim and it's kind of a it, the way i always like to describe it is what would a former SWAT commander uh, put in place uh, in terms of a training program for private citizens if they were completely unencumbered by any need for any particular number of them to actually pass so they could, you know, go on duty? Uh, and 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 what would that program look like? And that's that's that program. And uh, and so as time has gone on, and I was you know hired there and became an, ass an assistant instructor uh, under him and continued progressing. Eventually, he retired, and now I'm the the chief instructor of that public program, uh, which. I'm extremely fortunate to be, and uh, and as time has continued going on, I've gone out on my own uh, teaching nationally uh, with my own training. That's the pistol shooting solutions class that uh, Scott was in, and and uh, and Les was in as well, and uh, and uh, that's kind of intended to address a, a need that I. Be, came to perceive partway through my journey. I mean, I'm, I'm a, at my core, I'm absolutely, I am a self-defense guy. That's what I am deep at my core. I mean, I'm, I'm one of the timmiest timmies that I know. So it's funny when you said, <laughs> Scott, that, you know, all these tactical timmies may not know who I am. I mean, that's, you know, you're talking about me <laughs> for sure right there. And, uh, uh, but at some point, you know, you 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 do you do the, the the training that comprises the excellent foundational training of the defensive handgun world, which you know all of us are kind of of that of that uh, uh, realm, and 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 that stuff is great, and it is the foundation, and it should be, and you know, experience has to be the bedrock of all this, and it is. 
and at some point, at some point, I, I kind of became became vaguely aware of the the actual technical skill level possessed in the competition world by very skilled shooters there, you know, people that would be considered master or grandmaster level shooters in that world. And I thought of, and this was largely partly inspired by Todd Green, um, of a thought of, you know, how awesome would it be to be able to throw down that level of technical performance, but what, but with what I really walk around with on a daily basis. And that's when the late era of my shooting life kind of began to unfold. And I started to drive much harder at technical skills. And that's been just over the last, uh, probably about eight years or so. Um, and so that era has seen me, you know, move from being, you know, like just an, an NRA pistol instructor and a, an expired Glock armor and a judicious use of deadly force instructor through Masada Ub school, uh, the, now the Masada Ub group formerly known as LFI, um, and move on to over the last eight years or so, I've been uh, for eight years, we just, we just disbanded the GSSF team uh, that I've been a captain of for eight years. Um, I'm uh, fast challenge coin holder number nine. I'm tied with Manny Bragg to be the third person in the world to clean the Rogers test. And I'm the only person in the world to clean the Rogers test from concealment. Um, and just great, great honor to, to have the chance to have great experience to get to get to go there. And that was really awesome. Um, and I'm probably, and, and uh, one of the, uh, certainly right up there, one of the hardest things I've done is uh, classified uh, as a master in USPSA shooting limited division with my carry gear from concealment. And that's absolutely one of the hardest things I've done uh, in my shooting life. I did not find that easy in the slightest. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, that's kind of, kind of my background and, and uh, you know, I'm just interested, but you could, you could really boil it down to, you know, to me, there's, there's no such thing as being too good at fighting for your life with a pistol. So, you know, a relentless pursuit of refinement in technical skills is, is a very, very important thing to me. And even more so because I'm a private citizen and because if I do a really good job at the main job of a private citizen, if I do a good job recognizing problems early and going the other way, so I don't actually have to do anything more than go the other way and not be there, then I'm never going to amass experience right i mean that's it will, it will not be my role in life and so since i'm not going to have that ingredient that strongly uh, suggests to me that i need first of all you know all the training i can get and all the facsimiles of experience that you can get through training simulation training scenario training force on force and all the excellent foundational training that we all know and love but i also if i can't be experienced i might as well be really really good very Bang! Cool. Thanks for coming out tonight, guys. We're gonna Thanks wrap so it up. Me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gabe, you only kept for like ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was awesome, dude. That was awesome. Thank you. Now, yes, now let's sir. see if Les can one up that. All right, set the timer. No, um, <laughs> this is gonna be the fastest El Prez ever, right? Right. <laughs> so. Um, no, my name is Les Kiss Martoni. I'm uh, a lot of people nickname me Pepperoni because of my last name. So if you, if you, if you, <laughs> I do like pizza. I'm a fake Italian. You know who doesn't like Italian? Oh my god, I love that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's kind of it's kind of stuck over the years, um, uh, which is which is great. But uh, yeah, I, I lived out here in Illinois. Um, I grew up in the yeah, Chicago hey, area, yeah. and. Um, I just moved down to Florida, so Adam and I have been like IG chatting for a little bit and uh, about, about cool stuff in Florida. But um, uh, yeah, you know, it was really weird. I grew up in the city. My parents were immigrants, um, and so guns weren't really, uh, you know, they were nowhere on the radar as far as I grew up. Um, when I lived in the city, I lived in a pretty bad neighborhood, and uh, it was one of those things where thought, ah, you know, I should probably get something to protect the house, protect my wife and I or something. And um, bought a big old Smith & Wesson revolver. That was great. Um, didn't know how to use it. Didn't know what to do with it. So a buddy of mine took me out to the range, uh, started learning a little bit about it then. Um, so that was cool. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where I, I kind of accidentally fell into shooting USPSA. And once I felt like I was somewhat competent to protect myself and my family. Then I started getting into the competitive aspect. So uh, I shot production for years in USPSA. Um, I've shot a couple of nationals and, and did pretty well, like, um, you know, generally hovering around the, the top 20s. Um, so that that's pretty good for, for all the people that come out at nationals, all the really good people that come out at nationals. 
I've won some sectionals and, and stuff like pretty that. Good. It's, it's pretty, pretty good. good. You know, I mean, yeah, it's pretty good. You know, there, there, there's, a, there's a difference, right? <laughs> it's, it's tough though, right? You know, it, you're a working guy, you've got a family and everything like that. And you, you don't know how to get into it. So you get into some shooting and then it's like, oh, cool. Now I'm going to get into some reloading. And then you're like, okay, now I can shoot more. And then you get into like range access and all this stuff. And you start building up and building up. And you realize that some of these guys who are really like in the top tens, they're, man, they are, they, they put in a lot of time. It's no longer just a, hey, that's a really cool hobby effort that I've got to have. I mean, it is, it is a full-time job that they're doing. Um, and there, there really is a difference. And um, I, I don't know if I can burn that many cycles, honestly. Um, so I, I'm really happy to be top 20, but, but to, to get up into the top 10, I think that's another superhuman feat of being really dedicated and, and having a lot of like your logistics chain on what you're going to do, get, get there. But anyway, um, yeah, I, sh I shoot a Beretta, um, which kind of plays in with the whole pepperoni joke as well. So um, there are some guys asking about Beretta stuff. Maybe they'll ask later. I don't know. But uh, um, I like to shoot a lot. I'm kind of tailoring down my whole production GM thing and, and whatever. It's like I'm kind of, I don't want to say done with that, but I haven't, I haven't done that in a while. Mostly because Gabe came out here and taught a class in December. And I was like, well, it was actually Mickey, a uh, carry trainer, who said, hey, you know, you're an absolute hypocrite. And he's right. Um, I you know, always shoot with my gamer shit and, and whatever and gamer gear and go out and do that. But, you know, you carry his boat anchor every day and you know, appendix carry and you don't really do anything with it. How good are you with what you carry? And it's like, huh, you know, he's absolutely right. So start getting a lot um a lot of reps in with that start getting some practice with that uh gabe came out here did i think i did all right um and so it's just been one of those things to <laughs> what pretty good he got a fucking turbo pin fuck you bro he did and i was gonna say you know he he, he just asked the rhetorical question of how you know how good am i with it and i was i, I didn't want to interrupt but now that you interrupted i will too uh uh i saw the answer to that and the answer was yeah. extremely good i mean he, yeah. he shot uh, that you know what the thing the thing that impressed me the most about less in the uh the class testing whatever for whatever that's worth is um he shot alphas on every single shot yeah he didn't drop a single point under not any, one any, any any part none zero none he hit seven out of eight turbo and uh, and and the only one he missed he missed on just a hair of time but he didn't drop a single shot not a single shot not point, any it was a 226 bill drill and it was a point oh is that what it was yeah see exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I see how that irks you but man that's that's just that's rocking that's so, so awesome so, so i'm gonna do absolutely I'm, outstanding i'm yeah. gonna do a, i'm gonna do a mickey suit uh impersonation here i'm gonna try and put on my chicago so, uh, Les, you're great with that fucking gamer gear and shit. Yeah. How are you going to do with your real carry gear? How you going to do? Oh, pretty fucking good. That's awesome. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, go ahead. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, but that's the thing. You know, there, there's a process for it, right? And I think this is, I'm an IT guy. I'm fairly analytical about especially like watching guys like Ben Steger, they, you know, they have broken down how to get better. And I think this is the big, I think this is the big draw of competitive shooting in, in essence is that there is a point and there is a definite yardstick and trying to figure out what to do and how to get better. That, that's something that I think a lot of the people who are in the competitive world kind of have a, the people who are good in the competitive world, I should say, they kind of have figured that out. They know how to practice for the quiz or practice for the test and, and get there. That's, that's really neat. Um, that, is a, uh, that is a big deal. And I think a lot of that too, you can take into the self-defense world. And as Gabe said, you know, if I can't have experience, then at least let me be good and, and let me be very good. And I, yep. I, take, that, I take that seriously. So, yep. um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm, I don't know. I, I love to shoot. I don't, I don't necessarily love to go to like the, all the matches and the logistics. I'd rather kind of stay home with my daughter, hang out, explore Florida. Dude, it's awesome. I love moving there now. Um, it bums me out that I've got to be back here in this empty house away from the fam and everything. Um, but there, there's so much cool stuff to see and do down there. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. 
I'm stoked to hit some of the local matches. That that's the thing that was also like, why why do I need to travel to a big area match when I could just go to my local club scene and Alex Goot is going to be there, or or you know, Air Camps is going to be there, or I can shoot with Max Clatt and a, uh, Alfred Lidoris and stuff like that. These guys are really good open shooters. Or Mike Jinra, who's like a top 10 limited guy, he's he's always at the local matches at the club. So it's like, I, I mean, why, why do I need to travel to get that heat if that heat is already here? And Florida's the same way. It's like, oh, man, there's so many great shooters down there. It's just, it's, it's awesome. So up in Clearwater, up at uh, Wyoming Antelope Club, and then down at Hanson's Range, Homestead, uh, Universal, I held they have Ipsic Nationals going on this weekend, right? So that is a big deal uh, for the next few days. People are people are doing the national level competition for uh, IPSC nationals, which is distinct from USPSA. But I mean, that's cool. I, I mean, that that's the place to be in a way, other than Arizona, right? So, mm -hmm. so Les, I, I have a pressing question for you. Shoot, um, how do you feel about the loop going under? Oh man, that that killed me. I listened to their last songs and, and stuff like Same. that. Oh, it, that, that totally bummed me out. At, at, that was the point where I was like, I'm out of here. Forget it. That's you right. Know, like, you know, you took away my radio station. Ah, I'm done. Had, had I known a fellow Chicagoan would have been on here, I would have worn my, my uh, loop t-shirt. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, they were they were selling like bootleg loop T-shirts like leading up to uh, the last month and everything, and you can still find them and stuff like that. So, um, and Steve Dahl hosted that la the last couple hours. That was yep. awesome. Yeah. Oh, dude, it was it was great. Um, yeah, it, it it's it, it will be missed. Um, yeah, it definitely will be missed. But c'est la vie, right? So, yep. yeah. Will. I got I got some shotgun questions for you, and I don't mean I'm talking about the shotgun. I mean I'm got a question to shotgun to all of you. Okay. Talking about this, the first question I have is, and this is considering when you're competing, you're using your everyday carry type stuff. So, what's the biggest criticism criticism your receiver? What is the biggest criticism you are receiving from fellow competitors for using your everyday carry gear? Oh, that's easy. Why do you shoot a Beretta? <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Where's your next, right? <laughs> no. Uh, you know Tanfo's Italian, too. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, who wants, to, who wants to take that one? Well, you, you know, I, I could go. Uh, so, you know, for me, first of all, I don't receive a lot of criticism. Um, I have found the and this is this is especially speaking as an original Timmy going into the competition world. I cannot tell you how welcoming and how awesome, how cool everybody has been in the in the competition world. There's been one or two kind of prickly ROs at matches where he, they didn't know me and what I'm doing is strange to them and a little they don't know what to make of it. But but I mean I mean honestly, you know, from the other competitors, I I feel like I've gotten nothing but respect from them. So so you know, criticism, you know, not really. The, the biggest question that I get uh, along the same lines, though, is why don't you just put on a production rig and shoot the same gun? All you got to do is move the holster six inches behind the hip instead of, <laughs> yeah. you know, in the appendix position. Why don't I just do that? And, the, and, 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 you know, quite honestly, I think that's an extremely valid question and valid criticism because the draw is not a large part of USPSA. It's part of it, but you draw, you know, maybe one time a stage. Sometimes there's a classifier that has a couple of draws and, and on some stages you don't draw because it's a table start or a briefcase start or some random thing. So, you know, it, it is truly obstinacy on my part that I want to do it this way. That's how much of a Tim Timmy I am at heart it's it's like you know it, it, it to me it all has to you know your path in USPSA all has to stem from your core motivation and if your motivation is to play an excellent game and play the game and try to win the game which is the whole point which is a lot of the point of competing in any way in the first place then you should not do it a dumbass way like I do it I mean what's the point of that right but but and, and I do want to win the game. I think it's a cardinal, cardinal mistake in, in participating in USPSA to forego playing the game to win. But cool. and so I absolutely do want that, that you lose a huge amount of the value of it. If you just say, 
well, I can't win because blah, 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 gear excuse. I'm using my carry gear, so I can't win. You, you can't take that position. But what's even more important to me is the intangible payoff at the end is that I, when I go to the match and I run around, you know, uh, on, on six or 10 or 12 stages or whatever and go run around and shoot the gun as well as I can, which is, is reasonably well. Uh, you know, I am in pretty good standing with the other properly equipped, limited, you know, MGM competitors. I'm not like the last M. I'm, you know, usually mid-pack or high-pack. I don't usually win a major match, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I am compete like a credible one. But you uh, have. I, you won a well, sectional. I did. I won. That was that is my one and only major match win. I did win the uh, sectional last year, and I was really happy about that. And I was really happy that it was uh, not for lack of competition either. I had I beat uh, a GM and uh, and another uh, M or two who I've competed against before. And you know the M's, I beat them or I don't. I don't think I've ever beat that GM before. So it was you know it was it was it, I had legitimate competitors. Uh, yeah. And and so that was cool. But but um. It, it, the the intangible payoff for me is when I go, you know, and I go do my thing at the match and I know what that's like and I know what other highly skilled competitors do and I can, you know, hang with them. You know, maybe don't, I don't beat them all, but I can, I can be there. I'm in their world. I'm, I'm credible in their world doing it my way. And then um, and then when I leave the match I'm, and, and if stage nine happens at the grocery store. You know, I am walking around with exactly the same potential technical capability that I was able to throw down with in that match. And, you know, when you translate that into, I think, you know, what you can get done in terms of te the technical skills aspects of real life and the, the time frames and measurements that you can conduct of human dynamics under stress and in combat, I mean, a, a person who could, I mean, a B class shooter is like to normal people. Is like that's like somebody jumped straight out of the matrix. I mean, a, a, a legitimate M GM level shooter that can, if you actually, you know, if you actually put it together to throw down at that level, I mean, people are gonna it's, are, are gonna be like, I didn't know he, I thought he had the gun in his hand already because all of a sudden he was just shooting someone, or you know, they don't even see, they just see you twitch a little bit and you know, bam, straight to the dome. I mean, yep. you know, there's, I, I think that the the performance level unto itself can become a very powerful thing um, in circumstances that support it. And as long as you, you know, do the other big parts, right? Like, you know, you got to see it coming in time. You got to have good positioning and tactics because otherwise you can give the whole thing away and you're not going to win, not going to win on a tiny margin when you had to gather up a much bigger margin through awareness and tactics. But you know, that, that's all Timmy stuff that has got to be there and that's why it's the foundation. But um, so I guess to, you know, got total tangent from the question, but that's the biggest criticism I get or question rather not a rude criticism at all is why don't I just shoot production? But that's why that's the reason I don't, because I take great personal satisfaction in that specifically being able to perform at that level with my real carry gear. Great yep. stuff. Yep. And then also people ask you, why do you bother with a Beretta? <laughs> Actually, that's, that's good. Awesome. That will be a follow up question. Uh, Scott, how about you? Now, you know, these dudes know me, uh, well, okay, so I, I'll hop in there real quick. So as of right now, because I wanted to learn the game, right? So I've only this is my second full season in USPSA and uh, diving into uh, movement as Les is sick of me asking him questions about movement and stuff like that as a big dude. But yeah. uh, I appreciate I appreciate that, bro. Never. Anyway, uh, but I think it's it, it, I, I've hit another milestone where I, I, I beat a... Uh, a friend of me who is half my size in raw time. Uh, so I think I've heard certain things. I'm working out certain ways. And I, I, I'm honestly telling you that I have, uh, I got bored and I competed at a, at the NRA uh, local match from concealment. And I think I did an 84.5 on the classifier. And I have got to tell you, I've had I had more fun shooting that little Ricky Dink indoor match from concealment with my carry gear than I did uh, other regular matches with my gamer gear. Um, and, and one of the things I say in my classes is I don't care about your feelings, but man, it felt good. It just felt like what's important to me. You know what I mean? So so next next season, you know, I don't know exactly what I'm going to shoot it with. Uh, whether it be a 34 or maybe a, a, a comp 19 Roland S 
thing, but it's going to be from appendix. It's going to be from concealment uh, just because it's so damn fun. I don't have anything to prove to anybody, you know, and I, I just need to have fun and I need to get better for me. Um, in relation to people that um, the times that I have done it, I had had issues, but the, the one time, you know, that, that one time that I did have an issue. So, you know, everybody knows that my carry 34 is my competition 34 and I have a uh, striker control device on it. And uh, we were shooting some stage, some stage, the stage where it's like two, two, two from 30, then 15, then 10 weekend strong hand. I can't remember which one that is. There's so many of them. Uh, and the dude saw it. And he's like, Larry's like, Hey dude, just so you know, your back plate is flipping. I, I think something's wrong with your gun. And I went, Oh, it it's a striker control device, blah, blah, blah. It's, this is my carry gun too. So I can, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I explained to the guys like, why would you want to do that? I'm like, have a, gadget on my gun he's like no compete with your carry gun and my response is for the same reason why you want to compete with a gold laminated limb cat because hey, i want wait, to wait there's nothing wrong with gold guns there's right? nothing wrong with gold nothing guns. that's nothing that's wordless that's word right there <laughs> Thank you. Right? Like, because you know. i want to yeah but that's the thing because I, I i want to <laughs> Right. I mean, Italy right now. <laughs> exactly. Bro, you can take your Saddam Hussein model, you know, Limcat, right? And do what you want to do, Bo. Right. So anyway, so, 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 that, so, that, so that's the only thing. Um, most people are very highly receptive. They like, they do what you want to do. Most of them are smiling because they think you're a dumbass and you're not going to do, you're not going to do well going from that. But uh, so that's that. It, it's been really funny a couple of times people make some funny comments to me not at, because because they think i'm new because one, the usual most often the people that i see competing with you know carry gear or from concealment they're just they're new and they haven't learned anything about the game they're just they're trying it out with what they got and so this ro you know before i shoot a stage one time he he comes over he kind of like puts his hand on my shoulder being very fatherly and goes you know you don't you don't have to shoot from concealment i'm like oh i know i just want to thanks thanks and then yeah. you know and it was all good then he then then he saw me shoot and he decided I wasn't new, so it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ju jump in for a second. You know, you, you did like a live uh, live cast today over IG for a couple minutes, Scott. Yeah. And, um, you know, there was one person who said, hey, you know, I have had a little bit of like, not like scorn or derision or anything, but, but you know, some questions and, and questioning about what the motivation is. Um, you know, I think for some people who are considering doing that, if you like the game and you know enough about the game and you're safe and you really know enough about habitual good safety, go and do it. You know, the, the reason I bring up the safety aspect is, is just that, you know, you do put yourself on the clock. There is a little bit of the case of nerves and butterflies and all that stuff. And, and um, you know, still got to be remember to be safe and that you're out there competing and et cetera. And you want to do it and without getting hurt. Um, but yeah, go do it. You know, like, I mean, you can, I think there's still this big question about you can shoot USPSA from concealment. Like, yeah. Yeah, man. Like appendix carry is okay. You know, if you're shooting a, a, a nine millimeter, you're going to have minor scoring, which is, which is more difficult. It's a challenge. You're not going to be, you may be a little bit behind the curve because of that. You may be a little bit behind the curve because of some of the stuff with the draw, but um, as far as some times go, but once the gun's out, it's out, you're good. Shoot the alphas, you'll do all right. You know, so like, that being, lose the point. But, but to be clear, that doesn't, so for, for the guys that don't compete, if you wanted to shoot, for example, if you're a Glock shooter and you want to shoot a Glock 22 or a Glock 35 from concealment, then you're doing major. Right. Then, then you're doing yeah, major. Clear. Yeah. And actually, I forgot all about that. That is the other uh, suggestion that I've gotten the most is, okay, so you want to do it that way. Why don't you just shoot a Glock 35 and you'll get major scoring? And that is also a similarly very fair and legitimate question when it comes to the game. But I have long felt, that, and the reason I've resisted doing that, uh, I've long felt that that would not Im not contribute to my further development as a shooter yeah. as well. Um, you know, if you're trying to shoot approximately 90% of the points in USPSA, which is a, a pretty common guideline, 
Um, if all of a sudden shooting major, I can do that shooting alpha Charlie on every target. Uh, I, I, I do not think that that is better than the pressure I currently have to shoot so many alphas. I have to shoot so many alphas. I, the, the, the translation between minor and major, basically, in, in, a, in a major scoring division like limited uh, or open, uh, is, is that uh, in order to tie a major scoring competitor, I have to shoot the stage in the same time with half the number of Charlies that they shoot. And to beat them, I have to do better than that. And, and that, to me, creates that, you know, that's just an enormous pressure to shoot well. Yes. Challenge accepted. Yeah. There, there you go. That's the attitude. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's the segue over to John. John, how do you how do you shoot, bro? Do you go full, like, ranger gear? What do you do, man? <laughs> Actually, <laughs> so whether it's going to be from appendix or from uh, from some type of concealment, or my duty rig that I used in your class, essentially, like mm -hmm. with a Safari Land holster at the ALS. So it has somewhat of a retention, which it's it's pretty easy to, Defeat, to yeah. actually activate. So is it retention? But whatever. Um, so using that, uh, I get a lot of looks. A lot of looks from people. But after the first stage, I stop getting looks. And that's, that's when people start to kind of kick in. They're like, well, he's he's doing okay. Let me. Yeah. <laughs> that was really fast, and that was that was really good. <laughs> I'm gonna leave him alone for the most part. But before that, you get some looks. Some dudes are like, "Oh, uh, are you using your gear because that's what you work in?" And I'm like, "Not anymore." But you know what? I, I use it because I use all right because I use it on the other side. So why not use what I use normally to do something that I consider. Um, as Pannon likes to put, an extended drill, right? So each of the stages, just being an extended drill, that's just more practice for me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, even though there is a time, there is some stressors from that kind of stuff, I like it. I like being stressed out uh, to an extent or, or potentially stressed out because uh, most of the time I'm smiling as I'm going through. Um, but I really enjoy it, and uh, and that's one of those things that a lot of people don't realize is that, yeah, you you can just you can have fun while competing, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's okay. Like, no like, serious business. So afterwards, when all those uh, older dudes that are like there, like super serious, I'm I'm a competitor. You have multicam pouches. I don't look at you. You know those kind of guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> after they see you shoot a little bit, and they kind of they kind of warm up to you. They, they tend to be like, you know, why do you do this? And why do you do that? Or, or maybe even give you tips. You know, I had, a, I had an older guy, uh, he's actually Israeli and we got to chit chatting about, um, <laughs> uh, doing bad things to bad people. Um, but one of the things that, that he came up, uh, and was talking to me about was, was moving, you know, in a string or, or in a certain part of the stage, essentially, right? To never end on steel, unless it's absolutely necessary, like that's the only thing that's there or something like that, you know, because people stop or they'll go hit or shoot for steel, wait for the ting, then start moving, right? So hitting paper at the end, you're not waiting for ting, you're just waiting for sights on paper, play that game, move on. But if you end on steel, a lot of psychologically people wait for the ting before moving or before moving on to the next target, things like that. And, and it got me thinking, I was like, wow, this man has a point. I will give that a try, you know, because I am an open-minded human being and I love learning new things. So why not? Um, it was actually pretty good uh, for a couple of the stages. And then, like I said, it didn't come into play for a few others, but Hey, you know, you, you play the game that you're playing. Right. Um, and I thought that was those are little things that like kind of pop up uh, that I do like when they actually start talking to me after staring at me for a little bit, you know, on the first or second stage, and then and then move on from that. They're like, okay, your gear doesn't matter anymore. Talk to me. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, the, the, at first you're always, uh, or unfortunately, I'm always looked at funny, but after a little bit, it they usually warm up to you, or if they're used to seeing you, they warm up to you. Things like that. Um, the same with newer RSOs. I get I get R so funny looks sometimes because I take my sweet time at the end to show clear. <laughs> I love showing clear, but getting a sight picture and getting myself a nice little dry practice shot. 
So they look at me funny and they, they sometimes get a, a little bit butthurt about it. But overall, I, I end up getting a little more practice out of the stage compared to other people. Um, but that's, that's just kind of my outlook on that whole thing. And, and my, the criticisms usually come with just looks. They, they rarely say anything to me just because I, you know, either because I'm brown or something, or I don't know. So (laughs) (laughs) it could be multiple things. We've already broken the seal on that, man. It's all. (laughs) What seal? (laughs) Exactly. So so there's a lot of things that come into play in that world. So I just think it's because you're awkwardly good looking. Maybe, maybe they're like intimidated. They're like, that's a model. I don't want to touch him or talk to him. He's so intimidating. Yeah. Gas fight. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I I always find it. I always find it funny on that. Cause I I see other guys do that. You know, like for example, I think Mike green from green ops. Good dude is on here. And he does that too. He gets that last site picture to get another rep in and people kind of look at him weird. Right. And actually we were thinking, and uh, one of the, guys out there who's fairly new to competition but he's um he thinks he knows everything he goes what was he doing jedi i go he was getting an extra type picture dude blah 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 he was like why is he doing that it's wasting time i'm like yeah bro but that gm that just went that took three fucking minutes for his make ready you didn't say shit so let it go let it go <laughs> I would argue he's avoiding wasting time. He can yeah. have a purposeless repetition of of yank the trigger there at the end, or he can spend a probably barely a little bit more time to just be purposeful about it and have it be one good rep instead of one negative rep. Exactly. I completely agree. Yeah. Completely agree with that. Is you know, the I think, race at I the think, end. I think ahead, John and Les really hit on really hit on the two important things about how you are treated in USPSA is it's number one safety and number two skill so i you know i'm haven't shot nearly as much uspsa as les has but in my limited uspsa experience the the only people that i have found scary are poorly developed tactical dudes that come and shoot i don't mean like as an overall criticism of the tactical community but when you get one who is not a well-developed uh shooter and has a hard time contending with the technical demands of the stage and they're getting mentally, you know, kind of into deep water for themselves. Yep. They are the ones who you are watched. Watch, they are one of the categories that you're really most concerned about. Like, is he swinging that gun my way? Is he about to, you know, is he getting out of control? And, and, and I think that that's the first hurdle that with those looks that like John is describing, you know, when you're mm-hmm. doing things in pretty non-standard or unfamiliar way with unfamiliar gear to other USPSA shooters is first they're watching that you're not that guy. And then once they see that, then they're paying attention to, does this guy suck or not suck? And as soon as you yeah. clear that hurdle, it's all good. And everybody's yeah. happy as a clam, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think this, just to jump in real quick, I think this kind of underscores a point um, is, uh, you know, we run around with guns. There's a serious gravity to that yes. um, situation, and you know, there's no take backs or mulligans. And hey, we're all just playing a game until you know some shit goes down and somebody drops a gun and, and hurts themselves and or, or gets hurt or something. And you know, overall, it's a remarkably safe sport. Um, but um, you know, you almost never hear of of somebody getting injured or, or shot or anything like that in, in USPSA or hell, even IDPA. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not laughing at what you said, bro. I'm laughing at I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there. But, um, but, you know, the sports are, they're, they're pretty safe. But the point is, is that, you know, when you're going to a match where nobody knows you or you're the new guy and you may have some good experience, you may have like good unconscious good safety habits right that are that are great um that will make you you know go succeed very far in the sport i think the point is is that you do have to convince the rest of the people to trust you a little bit and they 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 are looking out for you and their reputation and your reputation so it's not not necessarily a bad thing i think that people are a little like that dude's pointing that gun at his junk should i be worried or not you know maybe it's better to say something now even if i'm going to be wrong than than have a a, a potentially lethal consequence from that. So I, I, I get that, you know, um, then when people kind of see who you are and see how you operate and do all that stuff, then they'll, they'll start to lighten up a little bit. That, that's, that's a good thing. But yeah. Well, it's funny yeah. for me. Um, like when I switched over to running carry gear is because I was never really 
you know, I was never going to be a top third. I was a middle of the pack shooter and nobody kind of gave a shit what I did. Like they knew my face because I showed up there all the time. And yeah. I was like, I'm never going to, I'm not going to win these matches. Like it just, you know, I didn't, I shouldn't say that I didn't care enough about the game, but I really didn't care enough about the game. I was like, oh man, you know, this is going to give me, you know, another place to, to go shoot different scenarios and work on recoil control and other aspects that I was more focused on. And I was like, you know, what do I do the other 99% of my life? I'm like I carry a handgun a very specific way. So I figured out that I could do it concealed and started running it that way. And the first time I got a couple looks, but after that, they're like, nah, it's Adam. We know he's safe. He's good. And nobody ever gave me shit. The only thing they ever gave me about was like a light on my handgun. Mm -hmm. But because I was shooting limited, nobody cared. All right. So. And now they don't recognize you. Nah, they, they, I, I shoot a little bit better, but you know, I go there to focus on me, and I'm not really competing against the other people. I'm just looking at my times consistently, from performance to performance, to match to match, and making sure that I'm at least holding my skill, and if I can excel and try to be better and place higher. They don't recognize him. They go, "That's Leonardo DiCaprio from The Quick and the Dead." That's what they fucking say. That's him. Look at him. That's right. <laughs> fucking look at him. Nope. <laughs> and, and now we have legendary lawman Chuck Haggard. Chuck. Oh, dude. Hey, hey Chuck. Chuck. The man, the myth. Nice to meet you finally. Good to Hopefully see you. Hopefully, he again, has man. audio. He can't hear us. <laughs> dude, Ch Chuck, and, Chuck and smoke an active shooter technology, not so much. No, he's he's working on setting it up. Okay, so my my follow on question Wait, is with that, that a pink door behind Chuck. Yeah, yeah. that's absolutely a pink door. Uh, he's that's the, uh, his daughter's a real pink door. I'm um, uh, shut the fuck up now about it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Chuck's on his way to your house right now. Exactly. That is <laughs> he's a legendary lawman and also the guardian for the door to Narnia. That's what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, poor Chuck. He can't even defend himself right now. He uh, I thought um, behind the pink, I thought behind the pink door was an adult movie from the 1970s. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, yeah. I'm not going to go there. Yeah. I don't know <laughs> something about a mustache. No. Um. <laughs> oh, look at him! He's putting on his gat right now. Well, look at him. Yep, yep. <laughs> so another shotgun question for you guys. Just shout out if you have an answer. If you want to answer, um, are do you have any r real differences between your competitive <laughs> gear and your everyday carry? So. What you carry every day compared to what you will be running when you're competing with your EDC my, stuff. Mine's simply a dot. Like my carry gun's a 34 with an RMR. My match gun's a 34 without an RMR. Only difference. So are you? But also, are you using like the same holster? Yep, uh, same another holster, mag pouch. Same light. Same mag pouches. Yeah. The only thing that changes for me is dot versus no dot. Anyone else? You gotta change that, bro. Jesus, bro. dude, it puts me in open, which I pro it shouldn't matter anyway, and I probably should, but meh, meh, yeah, meh. Anyone else have any changes in their gear from actual carry to competition? I mean, when I was shot like production in USPSA, I, I had a, a gun that was maybe a slightly like it was tuned up a little bit better. Sights were a little bit different, but. And, you know, no, pretty much the same. I take off the clinch pick, right, when I go shoot a match because that, that's a little. Why? Yeah. Then people look at you funny. Yeah. Why? Especially when you're getting alphas from that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't take off my knife. Yeah. I keep I keep waiting for the day that, you know, I like I get a bad round in my gun and it blows up and I drop it on the ground and go knife the targets because that's exactly what I'm going to do. Yeah. After you play the tourniquet. Actually, the, the, the thing, you know, honestly, I, I do have to change it up. So I've been carrying a clinch pick center line. And uh, it does get in the way of doing an appendix reload, which is one of the reasons why I do take it off. So I'm looking to – Darkstar has a number of different ways to carry a clinch pick um, or different – you know. So it's it's something I'm, I'm experimenting with. It needs more reps. Um, but we'll we'll solve that problem. But but that is that that's just legitimately like I care enough about the game that I'm going to go and I want to put some serious heat on some of the open guys. So 
it's hard enough keeping up with them. It's hard enough, you know, speeding up the reload and the draw and everything else and, and really, you know, going for blood. But, um, so I, it just, yeah, Hey, it just makes it that much easier. So, so, but the, so question is, uh, for you two guys that are shooting limited, um, and you've got extra capacity, you can have extra capacity. Do you carry, do you carry a reload? And when you compete, do you carry more reloads based on the game? So, well, so the differences for me on that are uh, no difference uh, or almost no difference. So I do have when I'm when I'm shooting USPSA, um, I have a couple extra magazines in a back pocket. If I somehow have the mega disaster that I've, you know, knock on wood, not actually had where I launch a couple magazines through the air and have to fish one out of my pocket. Mm -hmm. um, but I carry two reloads anyway, so they have been sufficient for USPSA. Um, and I've used the same magazines that I in USPSA that I've carried. I've let the carry be the controlling thing, and then I make it work for USPSA. And so uh, quite a while back when I first started, um, those were with, you know, factory G17, 17 round magazines. And then at some point I started using the um, Magpul 21 rounders and I carried those two and did a couple of adjustments with my mag pouches and concealment to make that work. And um, and that was neat. And and I'd, since then, I've actually I've gone to the Gen 5 G17, which I'm kind of enjoying now. And I've gone back to the um, the OEM 17 rounders. Uh, and so, you know, just got to make it work for USPSA. But uh, reloads, no difference other than there are a couple of I do have a couple of extra reloads in a back pocket that I have yet to I think I've shot 60 something matches total. And um, I have yet to actually have to use one of those mid stage. It just ends up being the, you know, like the mag I load with and then tack load at the beginning to have a totally full gun. You, you carry two pouches though, right? you got two, yeah. 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 I carry the exact, I mean, with the same rig you saw me with in class, that's what I carry. Right. Right. Oh, you carry two. That's right. You do carry two, don't you? Mm -hmm. Regularly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you ever have a chance going to, going to Gabe's class just to see his loadout is inspiring. Well, and what's really <laughs> what's really sick is that that is me. I I have cut way down. Um, there mm. was a, there was a time before I went to appendix when I r ran you know mirror image IWB G twenty ones and uh, and then later G seventeen. So you know I mean I'm not kidding when I say I'm like one of the biggest Timmies that I've ever that I've known myself. I mean I used to carry a lot of stuff. I mean more than I carry now, which is still a lot. Yeah, and why wouldn't you? And why would exactly because I can and because you know. And it wasn't like, you know, I, I feel like if you do your if you do your due diligence in practice and training, then you're not all screwed up to carry whatever, maybe by some people's estimation, ridiculous amount of gear. Um, if you don't do your, you know, your practice and your training and instead you're just all humping around a bunch of gear, that is stupid. But, um, you know, as long as you're as long as you're practicing with it and you practice to be co at least competent with it, you know, no issue to me. Yep. Yep. Les, did sure. you answer the question? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so I, I do carry a reload when I'm out and about. Um, I only carry one reload when I'm at a match. Um, I just, you know, unless you're doing like a table pickup, then then it's like, hey, make it work somehow, right? You can reload from a pocket or whatever. Um, you know, that, that, that's one thing. It's pretty rare that it ever becomes an issue at a USPSA match anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, as far as like the bread gear you know, earlier in the uh, IG live cast that we're asking some questions. So I'm, I've been using a keeper's holster and um, uh, I'm using one of the JM Kydex. Um, it's got the loops, the soft loops, and it's a high ride thing. Um, you know, and generally I carry like my, my mech art. What was that? And it's canted, right? It's canted slightly, yeah. So it just it kind of fans it out. It's just yep. easier. You don't have to break the angle of your wrist when you actually go for the uh, for the uh, the magazine. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm carrying like an 18 round Metgar magazine in the competitions. I do have like a couple where I do have an extended base plate. That you know, if you're playing limited, might as well play limited. Um, yep. The reload is still with a Metgar, but the the initial magazine is going to have like a 22 round capacity. So it makes it a little bit easier to complete the stage. I mean, it doesn't change the draw or anything like that. It just pops a few extra rounds into the gun, so I'm, I'm happy with that. So, I, I mean, it, it's it's a um, from a, a person who's going to go and, and be hampered by doing an appendix draw and shooting limited with minor. Um, 
I, I'll concede that, hey, that's not a bad move to, to start with a few extra pills in the gun. So um, either I'm looking at 19, but then Mechar makes like a, an extended capacity with like 20 rounds. The problem is the base plates are a little bit brittle. So you find like a CZ base plate because the form factor of the magazines is pretty close. So getting into some tech BS, whatever, that, that important, but you can, you can get 22 in, 23 to start, I'll take it. So huh. that's fine. That's still go. a lot of rounds. I have a uh, Langdon 92 coming. I'm really looking forward to it. Don't haven't dealt with bread as much, but I uh, went and ordered a bunch of higher capacity mags just because yeah, the, I the like Metgar, those. Yeah, the, the, the Metgar specifically. You know, I'll say this. You know, a lot of people kind of, you know, to to go slightly off topic for you know, bread a magazine system is actually pretty robust. Even the old 15 round magazines, if you clean them, they're good. You know, even like some of the checkmate magazines and whatnot. If you clean them and you've got a good spring in there, it'll feed the gun. It's good. Um, the the Mechar magazines are excellent. They have a little taper to them. It's a little easier to reload. But the factory Beretta mags are, are are great. Like they're no no reservation to load up with one of those. It's just maybe slightly harder to reload. You can bump the gun a little bit on the lip of the magazine, but um, it, it's good. You know, if you ever have any questions with that thing, man, hit me up. Like you know, oh happily. Yeah, dude, I don't know if I'm going to hit you up as often as Scott, though. <laughs> yeah, that's not possible. So before we get to Chuck, because I really want to hear what Chuck has to say, though. Uh, to be clear, uh, Les is also. Are you master or distinguished master? No, I'm. I'm just a master, like in IDPA. Just. Okay, you're not. You're not old enough to be distinguished master, right? Yeah, I mean, so I guess <laughs> I the way just... they. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So uh, Les is one of the few here that actually shoots IDPA as well. I think Chuck does as as well. Uh, what is your now? You can't shoot appendix in IDPA. So what do you do? Yeah. So let, let's you know let's talk about let's talk about IDPA for a second. Um, so oh, IDPA, let's yeah. let's yeah yes <laughs> let let's cheers to that. Um, so, so funny. Yeah. So so here's the thing. I I you know. Yeah, you can't do a lot of things that you can do in USPSA. So IDPA, you have you know pretty much a ten round cap on the guns and uh, on the capacity. Um, the interesting thing about IDPA with the new rules, with like a full second point down or a full second per down, right? Because if you, if you shoot essentially zone or whatever, then they're going to add a complete second to to your time to your run time. It does make IDPA fairly challenging, right? You cannot outrun. So the um, the premium really is on shooting incredibly accurately. And I think for the purpose of, or the intent and the purpose of why IDPA was organized, I think this is actually a really good thing. Um, it's not as fast. It's not as sexy. It's not as so fun sometimes as USPSA where you can run around and squirt bullets and, and all this stuff. Um, where the technical challenges in USPSA, I think, are, are much more interesting. IDPA is actually a really good use of, I think, a lot of the people who are going to load up and carry every day. Um, it is, it's, it's eating some humble pie. If you're going to go to a match and you're going to get more than just a few points down, hey, that's a wake-up call. Don't miss. Don't be stupid. You know, don't take a shot that you, you know, that you can't accurately take, right? Um, because that, that's bad. It has liability. So for the point of like practicing some of the traits that may that may be a better thing for people who are going to conceal carry, I think that's not a bad thing. I I, I will. I like IDPA. I, I really like IDPA now with the new rules. Um, it does bum me out that you can't do appendix carry in IDPA. I think there's still very much a perception that IDPA in some way feeds into USPSA. People come in. They try a simpler thing that's more scripted, which is IDPA, lower round count, definitely much more constrained with gear, and then somehow they'll feed into USPSA. Um, you know, it, it bums me out that that is a perception. It bums me out that that IDPA hasn't evolved some sometimes with some of the other things that that are going on in the gun world. Um, you know, they said that they would never do red dots. Now they're considering red dots. This is great. This is this is a step in the right direction. Um, it, it, you know, I, I wish they would allow appendix though. I really do. A lot of people carry it that way. I would say 
I don't know. What, what would you say? Is it more popular than strong side hip, you know, IWB nowadays or, or not? Uh, I don't uh, think it is. Yeah, you know? I, I don't think it is. I mean, so, so and, and this is going to, I'm not trying to sound like a dick. Sure. <laughs> I'm oh, you're not. a mod. I'm not, but I'm a He's I'm not a trying to. Lie. But I'm going to tell you, I, I, I actually, I don't even know that. So I'm going to say, with a age group of less than sixty, with a person that had trains at least once to takes a class maybe one to two times a year. I think append the level, uh, the number of appendix carriers is much higher. I don't. I don't know if I just put my foot in my mouth. And on that, we're gonna let Chuck Haggard answer. <laughs> Moving on. So. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> wow. What do you think, what, there, Chuck? What was the initial question? Uh, if so, I were Twinkie. Oh. <laughs> yeah. If I were Twinkie. Yeah. So. <laughs> so. Do you think? Do you think appendix now? Uh, well, first of all, we're gonna ask, who the hell are you, Chuck? <clears throat> Do you uh, do you think that appendix now is more prominent than three o'clock for your average uh, concealed carry uh, person who actually carries his gun? Um, not in my observation, it's not. Uh, okay. And I'm playing with my apparently my my laptop had some kind of update and everything got screwed up, which is why I was late. And now my volume is doing weird stuff. Uh, so anyway, my observation, uh, going to classes, going to, uh, like tactical conference, things like that. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, appendix has yet reached the popularity of strong side carry or, or strong side inside the waistband carry. I would guess it's probably, I don't know, 20, 25% of what I'm seeing. Uh, there's still a lot of people that are carrying, uh, behind the hip, inside the waistband, something like a Milt Spark Summer Special, uh, with some of the Kydex versions, things like that. Um, that's what I'm seeing most prominently in large conferences, large uh, large classes that I've gone to that are not, um, you know, appendix oriented. They're just like an open registration or something like that. Hey, can I ask you a question real quick, uh, Chuck, before you move on there? Sure. With, this, with this last tack on with all my friends there, except for me, I'm hoping to change that right with the top 16 and the, let's say let's take the top six, which were all appendix. Do you think within the community of Tom's tack con that people are going to start changing mm -hmm. that perception and maybe start going to appendix? I think I think it's slowly moving that way. Um, it, I know there are people who hang on to it because of build, um, uh, things like that, perception of safety, uh, whatever the case may be. I think uh, appendix, all else being equal, from a concealed carry standpoint, appendix is faster. Uh, probably it probably cuts a good point two, good point two five off of my concealed draw between appendix and behind the hip. Um, that's me personally. I think most people are measurably faster. Uh, and I haven't been working it. I, I was carrying appendix in the eighties with revolvers yeah. I got out of the habit. When later we went to semi-automatic pistols, I was carrying behind the hip in a milk sparks holster. And I did that for man, I don't know, 25 years. And uh, uh, Spencer, when I retired in 14, Spencer actually gave me a keeper's holster as a retirement gift. Um, and uh, I could tell you one of the reasons I went to it was behind the hip was starting to give me back problems. Uh, and I ended up going to Spencer's class and I got back into appendix carry, you know, kind of back to the future sort of thing. Uh, I think it's measurably faster. If you look at Craig Douglas, uh, the, the Shiv Works Collective body of work, uh, Paul Gomez, uh, Paul Sharp, Larry Lindemann, those guys, Chris Fry, uh, they have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that in-fight weapons access 
to appendix carry is far, far better than it is uh, anywhere else. Centerline carry is where you want your gear forward of your lateral midline is where you want your weapons in a fight. Um, I think that there's no disputing the, the empirical evidence that they brought forward in, in pressure tests of that stuff. Uh, I think the evidence is slowly going to bring people around. Cool. I completely agree with Chuck on all counts there. And uh, I think uh, right down to the percentages, I, I would have said 20, 25% uh, appendix carry and the rest strong side. And, you know, I, I don't think that's really different than it should be. I mean, strong, I, I think strong side is always going to be the foundational method of carrying a handgun. And, uh, and, and I mean, you know me, I mean, I love appendix and I think it's, it's great and I don't see myself wanting to go back to strong side, but it's, uh, it's something you kind of, you go to, I, I would not take a first day. You are just now learning to draw from a holster person and tell them you ought to go to an appendix rig. I wouldn't tell them that. I mean, if they, insi if they brought it and they insisted on it, I'd, you know, try to teach them what to do with it, but, sure. um, that, that's not what I tell them to start with. It isn't. Cool. I think uh, I, one, of the, one of the things I'm going to throw out there is, is that there's a perception that there's safety issues with appendix carry. And, uh, you know, famously, you'll shoot your junk off, you shoot yourself in the femoral artery, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, a problem I have with that is that that leads a mindset to you can kind of relax some when you are using strong side gear. And I think that that's probably a bad idea. I know it uh, wasn't too long ago. I know of a case where somebody torched one off and they were doing strong side hip carry. They put the bullet uh, through the top of their calf. It went from outside to inside, top to bottom, top of the calf, outside the leg, exited near the ankle on the inside of the leg and route cut the tibial artery. So right then and there, you're a tourniquet case and emergent transport to the hospital you're going to have to have some microsurgery things like that um, i've seen a number of cases typically thankfully mostly uh street criminals shoot themselves with guns um, and outside you know they tuck it in that side of the waistband or they had their finger in the, the trigger when they had the gun dangling down by their leg and you know you shoot yourself in the femur from outside in or if you're doing the dig the gun into the inside the waistband uh, from the outside when you're trying to get the gun in uh, if you shoot yourself from the, through your pelvis sideways that's going to be a very very bad day um, so i, I kind of have a mindset issue with the idea that appendix is somehow more dangerous. Um, I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure that it's any more dangerous or any less forgiving in how we draw a holster, things like that. I, I really don't. I, I would agree with that again. And, 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 and I would add that, you know, to me, as usual, the, the, the devil's really in the details on this because, uh, you know, to me, I, I get the criticism of appendix when done poorly, but, you know, I would extend that criticism to all of holster work. All of holster yeah. work is a, 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 entails plenty of risk that has to be managed through personal diligence and doing it well, doing the right thing all the time, every time, and with multiple redundant layers of safety. It has to be that way. And if a person is bad enough, is behaving badly enough in terms of safety management that I would not want them running an appendix holster, I don't know how I would say, but you're okay running a strong side holster, especially an inside the waistband one. Uh, mm -hmm. I completely blew up my own mind when, you know, there was a, you know, as usual, a great internet discussion on uh, one of the forums. It was on Pistol Forum. And, um, it was about the subject of the, you know, the perceived dangers of appendix carry versus other versus strong side methods and positions. And so I wanted to produce some sort of illustration of it, whatever that turned out to be. And so I did an experiment. You can look it up on my uh, YouTube channel. It's called Rule 2 Comparison. And uh, and what I did was I lowered the lights in the range so you could see a laser really well. I took a cert, so not a gun, a cert. And I took some duct tape and taped the laser back, so or taped the trigger back so it was on continuous discharge. And then I went through um, three different carry positions, strong side OWB, strong side IWB, and a heavily wedged appendix holster, keepers. 
Um, and I went through several very common actions done in high volume on the range and training because high volume is very, is very much the part of the concern where, well, you're going to be, you're, you know, sure you could do it safely a little bit, but you're going to do it 10,000 times on the range. That's where your accumulation of risk lies is, is one of the, the parts of the, the view there. So I went through standing still and drawing. I went through taking a big sidestep left and drawing, went through taking a big sidestep right drawing. Uh, and I went through uh, busting into a run to the left while drawing and same thing to the right. And then I did one, you know, walking forward and walking backward. And you could see the laser very clearly uh, on me when it did and didn't uh, cross my body. And, you know, the results were quite shocking. Uh, with a heavily wedged appendix holster, it, that had the very least amount of muzzle lower body intersection during those activities. And uh, the strong side OWB was had a lot more self muzzling, but it wasn't nearly as terrible as the strong side IWB, which resulted in full upper leg, full femur and femoral artery uh, self-muzzling on the draw any time you took a step or moved, especially to the side. So what it really boiled down to is that with an appendix holster, things that make your legs get closer together introduce, cause more self-muzzling when the gun's coming in and out of the holster. And with strong side positions, legs coming together reduces it. And it's the reverse also. So with appendix, things that make your legs get wider reduce the self-muzzling. And things, and with strong side, things that make your legs get wider increase the self-muzzling by a lot. And hmm. of the common range activities, they're all legs wider activities. You take a step right, you take a step left, you bust running right, you bust running left. All those things have legs going wider and not so much together. And so, you know, I've come to see it as appendix done badly is could could certainly could be really bad. But I think you can also say that about all of holster work and uh, appendix done extremely well, in my opinion. I now thoroughly believe for myself that it is probably quite a bit safer than any of the strong side carry methods, especially IWB, but that there's risk entailed with all of it. And they're all legitimate practices that, you know, you've got to engage in what we recognize as safe holstering and, and drawing habits. You, you have to. And if you don't, you ought to just give the whole thing up or fix it. You got to do one of the two. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. I have to awesome. agree hundred percent with Gabe, especially as a person that is relatively new to appendix, like picking it up within the last six months. And since, you know, the previous 10 years of my life, uh, being strong side, I actually felt safer and it was almost like a comfort blanket to be able to watch myself put the gun away, shift my hips forward, knowing when I was holstering, as opposed to coming to my side, having to like, you know, make sure my holster was clear to dig it in there. Like I, it was just, it was so much more natural and so much more comforting holstering appendix than it was strong side. And that's coming from a person that's picked it up within the last six months and uh, Scott saw me at the class and I, I think I did okay, but I, I have always felt since picking it up, I could be faster, I could be safer and the economy of motion was more efficient doing appendix vice, uh, IWB, uh, strong side. Um, yeah, I, 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 that's my view as somebody new to appendix or relatively new to appendix. Yep. I would agree with that. I'll tell you what the mindset thing, um, I would almost, I'm, I'm almost thinking that the, the perception of it being a greater danger is a good thing. People are going to be more careful about putting it away. Uh, it's when you get lax, um, you start cutting corners and that kind of thing. You start digging for the holster. You don't spot clothing interference and all of that. That's when people shoot themselves, typically on holstering. One of the real issues with inside the waistband strong side is most people can't see the entirety of their holster, um, particularly one of, one of the, uh, the criticisms I've heard from people as well. You know, you got to be skinny to carry appendix, which is not true. No. But, um, larger people carrying behind the hip are going to have less visibility of the holster, less ability to see it. I've lost track of how many times I've been on a range, I'm AI or something like that. I see somebody trying to stick a gun in an inside the waistband holster and they have t-shirt in the holster and that sort of thing. And I have to, I have to, you know, call a, Hey, freeze, 
cease fire, don't move, you know, before you shoot yourself in the ass kind of thing. Whereas if you have the perception with uh, appendix that it is more dangerous, you're going to do the, oh, I need to ease this thing in, um, you know. Uh, so it's probably, I think, probably a good thing in the overall uh, scheme of what we're talking about. Well, Chuck, yeah, I would, as a as a previously heavier dude, you're 100 percent right. Like big dudes that complain that you can't carry appendix all go IWB strong side. And I'll give you a, a pro tip: we can't see shit reholstering. Like, there's just too I'm, much. There's just too much man meat there. Like you're 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 basically just you're you're hoping that you're getting it in, or you at least feel the muzzle touch the opening so you can index off it. There's there's no fucking looking phrasing. Down. Yeah. Yeah, there's no looking back. <laughs> it's just it, there's no way. And with appendix, I at least can do uh, what I call post-flight check, and I make sure that when the gun is out of flight, I know that thumb goes back to slide, my hand comes to my shirt, and I'm watching every movement down, and everything is deliberate. And again, it's because of the preconceived. It's more dangerous, but now it's I do it enough daily on dry practice that it's just ingrained in me for reholstering and it all started of dude i really don't want to shoot myself in the dick or i really don't want to shoot myself in the thigh okay. I, I will tell you that i think a, a comparable um example from aiwb and the and the care that people take versus strong side is the same thing you see when you're running a hot range versus a cold range when it's a hot range everybody is careful because they know they're they're you know locked and loaded right we're on a cold range i find the care to be a lot more lax it's it's okay everyone's unloaded uh no it's not and i some, sometimes see that same you know flick of a reholster on the three o'clock uh, as opposed to when that same person is doing appendix and they take that care of putting their hips forward looking into the holster and putting the gun away so that is a great observation, Scott. And uh, I was going to actually bring up a different one in the same vein as the same minor complacency. You know, this is not universal. So please don't take this as me saying that everybody who uses these types of guns d operates this way. They don't. And they can provide legitimate layers of safety. But um, a striker fire, a I see the same thing in some people in some instances between a striker fired gun with no manual safety and that has a medium or medium light a pretty modestly weighted uh and length trigger pull versus d long heavy da triggers and guns with manual safeties is that those end up at times in some people engendering the same minor level of complacency that can you know turn it really bad yep yep So do, do we want to introduce Chuck since people may be living under a rock and don't know who he is? Might as well. Who the hell Take are you, on Chuck? those people, tell them. <laughs> exactly. Who the hell are you, Chuck? I'm just some, I'm just some old guy with a bad hip right now. Um, so uh, retired from Topeka Police Department, did 28 years there, uh, 14 years in the National Guard, not much military to actually speak of. Um. I'm currently working another job, so I've been in law enforcement 30, almost 32 years now. Uh, firearms instructor, defensive tactics instructor, low light instructor, active shooter, uh, tactics instructor. Did 17 years on our SWAT team here uh, in, in the Topeka area. It's a very, very busy team, very busy. Uh, and I like to shoot. Uh, I'm a gun nut. Uh, uh, I think that's that's about it. Cool. And, and then long, long walks on the beach, and I do, in fact, like long walks on the beach. <laughs> and there you go. So, Chuck, you, what, what do you prefer? Or what do you compete mostly in? IDPA? Am I wrong about that? What do, what do you oh, do? And, what, and what's, your <laughs> <laughs> and what's your rig? What's your rig, man? Um. Last time I shot a classifier, I've, I've always classified expert. I've always been like half a second from master every time I've done it, um, which is what it is. Uh, I haven't been 
you know, fortunate enough to be able to run as hard as I would with some of the training and things like that. Uh, heck, when I was a range master for my old job, I found out my shooting got cut. I had my own range. I had access to, you know, 200,000 rounds of ammo in the ammo uh, room. And I did less shooting than everybody else because I was always working and doing chores and teaching and things like that. Uh, I do shoot USPSA. Uh, I haven't been to a classifier in a very long time. So uh, I shoot for giggles. Uh, when I started in competition, it was actually I was in the military. And uh, I was going to various matches, typically in our area, what the guard had was patent matches. And those were all rat grade guns is what they would call it. So it started with 1911s. And then uh, one day I came to work and we were headed to uh, the match over in Salina, Kansas. And we showed up and here's your brand new Beretta M9 still in the Cosmoline paper. So we had to pull those out of the paper and wipe them down and load them up and go shoot them. Uh, so that was interesting, but they turned out to be, uh, what Les was talking about, very good guns, very accurate guns, easy to shoot well. I found very, very reliable. Uh, actually won some trophies with, the, with those guns. Uh, so that's my first foray into competition was bullseye and then the what they call combat matches in the, in the military. Um, got into USPSA back in the 80s because there, there was no IDPA. And then for a very long time, Kansas did not have concealed carry. So there was no IDPA demand and nobody there. There was no drive to bring it here. Guys, uh, guys went USPSA, shot race guns. Um, I made a decision back then that I was going to shoot my duty guns. We were carrying Smith & Wesson third generation 9 millimeters, like the 5906s, and uh, they have a Beretta type safety. What I ended up doing was getting rid of my 1911s because I didn't want my thumb to get confused on which way it had to go on a safety or decock, things like that. So I would go to USPSA and shoot my duty gear and get some trigger time with my 5906 and just, you know, try to do as well as I could. Um, I like competition in that what you are doing is shooting somebody else's problem. It is natural for us to go out and shoot what we're good at or shoot and kind of screw around, you know, unless you're a guy like Gabe where you're really, you know, analytical in what you need to work on and how to work on it and come up with drills on how to do that sort of thing. Uh, most people default to, you know, kind of screwing around actually and burning ammo. So one of the things I like to do is use that as a reality check. I could run around, uh, you know, I'm shooting from kneeling, I'm shooting from under the fake car, shooting long range, shooting short range, et cetera. So uh, I would just go out and shoot my duty gear. Um, and I didn't do too bad. It was always middle of the road. You know, I'm shooting a 12 pound trigger minor gun back when there was only limited and unlimited. So uh, I, I just, you know, I just dealt with it. Uh, I think it made me a better shooter. Then when uh, IDPA came along, I got into that. Of course, what uh, Les was talking about, you have to download your magazines to 10 rounds, that kind of thing. By the way, I use Mechar mags for Smith & Wessons uh, because uh, instead of the seven, the 15 round mag that was stock, the 17 round was flush fit, and then I had 20 round reloads. The Mechars, uh, superb, uh, very, very good gear. If you have a gun that you can get Mechars for, that's a, that's a good magazine. Um, anyway, so uh, for IDPA, I uh, just took my, uh, about the time I got into IDPA locally, we went to Glocks. So um, back then I was carrying behind the hip. I would just shoot my, uh, Glock, 7, my Glock 17 duty gun from my Milt Sparks from concealment and just, just you know, download my magazines. Uh, now I am carrying, uh, sorry about that. Um, of course you'd have a home phone. You know, it's, I'm actually using my wife's office right now. It's her office phone. Um, she's got a, she's got a landline because, uh, it's the office. I thought, uh, thought I had the answering machine, uh, cut off. So, uh, anyway, um, utilize, uh, I'm utilizing appendix for concealed carry. 
which I can shoot USPSA, but I can't shoot uh, IDPA. So what I've defaulted to doing, since I carry, I still have a duty holster, and my local club has, uh, um, you know, they're really good about working with cops and things like that. I just use my, my bring my duty rig to, to a match and shoot there. Or I'll use an ALS because I carry an ALS at work. I'll use an ALS, uh, one of the ones that's more the concealment version, um, and wear that so that I'm uh, working with a retention. Um, I've simplified my system to either carrying appendix uh, is my concealed carry, or if it's on my strong side hip, it's an, in an ALS holster because of what I don't want to do is get in the habit of not um, – defeating that retention mechanism on the gun. So that's what I've been doing. Um, I'm, uh, I've seriously considered going uh, uh, full gamer with, uh, I ended up with a trade with a buddy. I've got a Glock 31. I've got a KKM 40 caliber barrel for it. Uh, I got a buddy that gave me a magwell and I'm uh, dangerously close to going full limited retard with that gun. So I might do that just because I can I can still shoot, you know, my same weapon system from uh, from a concealment. Maybe try to duplicate Gabe's achievement except uh, cheat a little bit and shoot major. You know, I you think know, that that is that, uh, that's, that's, that's interesting. That's an interesting thing, and I think that's a classically successful pattern um, that you shoot the game gun and rig in the game, and then you shoot your carry gun and rig not in the game. And as long as you actually practice with both those things, you're probably going to get a lot of benefit from it. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, it's it's not the route I go because I think there's another route, which is the deep familiarity route of you run exact same thing all the time in all the circumstances, and you figure out how to shoehorn that thing that you have selected into all the circumstances. And I think that the benefit that I that I get from doing that is the deepest possible familiarity that I'm going to be able to get. But there's a whole flip side to that coin that I, you know, it's not the route that I go, but I think there's a very legitimate flip side to that coin that's been recommended to me many times. This is another one of the, uh, uh, you know, suggestions that I've gotten is, you know, shoot a, a game gun, like shoot a juiced up production gun in production or get a limited gun and shoot that. And the benefit in theory that's been asserted to me, and I don't, I don't disbelieve it is that that's like, you know, you go and drive the race car and learn to do some high performance things that are not as easy to come up with with your harder gear. And then you can take that greater knowledge and awareness, the greater um, uh, awareness of the gun as it's firing, as it's cycling, as you're moving around, all that stuff that's maybe easier to find and sharpen yourself with, with a, a set of higher performance set of gear. And then take it and apply it as well as you can to the, uh, the carry gear. And, you know, I, I think that's, that's another very legitimate way to handle it. I do. It is. But, but when you uh, start going down the road of questioning limitations, right, uh, with your carry gear, for example, I posted in another group. I know that I know that you can do it. I'm pretty sure that Les can do it. I do it in my classes now where I have basically been told, so it used to be said, and I say this in my classes, it used to be said that if you can do a two second build drill, right, you could be a GM. These days it's, you might kind of sort of think about maybe someday being a GM from an open carry rig, right? The, the way that uh, at least AIWB has been pushed is there are dudes like yourself I'm going to put myself in that because I've done it enough cold in my classes and less that can do a two second build drill from AIWB concealed in less than, right? Without pushing the boundaries and saying, I can do this with my carry gear and we're going to put it to the metrics and, and, and push those boundaries, we're not going to get there. Does, it, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'm just describing 
an alternate way to handle it that is classically sure. successful over time and that I respect that method as well. Kind of to, mm-hmm. to what Chuck is saying, you know, hey, I'm going to go full limited retard and shoot a retard limited gear uh, in, in the game. And then, you know, and then you got your duty rig. And as long as you practice with both, I think you're going to be all right. And I think it will contain benefit. Um, and, and but what you said is how is absolutely how I feel for myself. And I think that's been a, a that probably the single greatest key um to my performance shooting life and, and, and any and all of my accomplishments is to throw off the yoke of low expectations that so frequently comes from the tactical world or from using gear that is typically used in the tactical world and say, and, and adopt a growth mindset instead of a fixed mindset and to simply flatly just state and decide from the very beginning as a personal policy that what one person can do, another person can learn to do. So if Dave Savigny, can shoot this well, then I can learn to do that too. And even if I fail at that, which is ultimately highly likely, because at this point it's highly doubtful that I'm going to become a you know multi-time national and international level champion, right? I mean, just like Les was saying earlier, I also do not have the time and 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 just the wherewithal in my life to practice that much to get mm-hmm. that sharp. But that as a personal policy, it's by far the most productive one that I could adopt because by reaching for that, reaching really hard for that, to whatever extent I'm motivated and able to do so, you're gonna get you're gonna go so much further. Even when you do fail to become Dave Savigny, uh, you're gonna go so much further than if you just said, well, Concealed carry gear, stock gun, it's not happening, so I'm not even really going to try that. I'm going to be happy with my, you know, perfectly respectable, but not, you know, not screaming high three and a half second build drill. Sure. So, that's so, I, so I agree with you as well, Scott, I do. Yeah. So to, yeah, just- to clarify, I was talking about carrying using my exact same, like my same appendix rig. And then just uh, throwing like a legit limited gun in there. Um, mm-hmm. I figure there might be a little bit of uh, training benefit into shooting a major gun that kicks a little bit more. Um, but yeah, uh, sticking a Glock 40 in my holster and then carrying a Glock 9, I don't think is a bad deal, especially since yeah. it's the exact same holster. Um, and then I switch back and forth because I mean, if I was retired, it would be uh, appendix uh, all day, every day. But I go to work, I have to carry a duty pit, uh, rig, uh, you know, a cop gun belt. And then when I conceal carry, it's appendix. So I do have to, I agree with Gabe, if you were going to go all in on one method and one gun, that's probably a good idea for max potential. But I have to switch around a little bit, yeah. um, you know, so it, it is what it is. I got to deal with it. Sure. Yeah, no, I, sure. I hear you there. I mean, some people are going to have their, you know, their patrol gear, their SWAT gear, which are not the same. And then and then their their concealed carry gear. And that's not the same. And now you're going to add competition rig. And so, it, you know, whether you want it or not, some people do to just due to their roles in life are going to have to switch gear and deal and, and contend with those differences. Um, you know, to what you're saying about same rig, just put a, a 40 caliber Glock in it and the greater recoil control not being a bad thing. I would agree with you as far as that goes. I think that the pitfall that you got to stay away from uh, for, for the purposes that I'm, you know, I know you have, and I know you have the discipline to do this is to, you, you need to shoot that 40. If you're shooting limited with a 40, I think for, for your purposes and for my purposes, I think you need to shoot like you're on the super squad at nationals and you need to shoot, attempt to shoot all alphas and not succumb, not succumb to the invitation of major scoring that you can just host some alpha Charlie on every target because at many levels of competition that is going to serve you just fine points wise in the game. Um, I, I think, I think that, you know, for, for defensive purposes, I think it's, I, I do think it's important to be disciplined against that specific attraction. And I know you can do that. Yep. 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 The struggle Matt, is have, real. You, yeah. Matt, do you have any, <laughs> yeah. Do you have any questions before I get to, I, I want to ask lots of questions. Is that all right? Yeah, and yeah. Then, and all, because all basically, my I would have one last closing question that would be just talking about the gear and the guns people are carrying because I'm sure someone's going to ask. So okay. might as well. But so, that could so, be just our our final. So 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 this is directed to Les and Gabe. Uh, what have you guys found? Obviously, there's there are many things that are harder by choosing to run from you know your your uh, your carry gear. Uh, they're not, and that's kind of the low hanging fruit. What have you found though to be, oh, 
this really isn't that big of a deal, if anything. Does that does that make sense? The stuff that's easy, even though it's secure gear? I don't know. Um, well, the, the stuff that you thought that was going to be, oh, this is going to be some shit right here. And it really wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, I, I practiced for a long time to get, you know, pretty pretty good with uh, the appendix draw. So I put a lot of time and effort into that. And I had to stop doing a lot of the, um, you know, the, the draws from gamer gear or anything else. Uh, you know, to let's just say to the exclusion of doing anything with something else. Uh, so it was exclusively forcing myself to use appendix draw and all that. And, you know, to, to get pretty competent, um, you know, it didn't take as long as I thought. Um, there are a couple more tweaks, so you have to be open to the fact that there may be some slightly better ways to do it that you might want to key in on type thing. Um, but yeah, it was kind of surprising how quickly it, it, it happened. And it was surprising how fun it was to, to do it that way too, like to shoot from appendix uh, in a match and, and really do almost no worse than if I had shot in production. Maybe better because I didn't have to reload this up. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, yeah, it's like, hmm, I'm going to break this down and shoot eight rounds here and then reload and shoot eight rounds here. Um, you know, so it's like, oh, I can just squirt a whole bunch of bullets here and squirt some more bullets. And now I can contemplate the reload as, as I move or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess that was one of the things. I mean, shooting limited kind of opens up some of that possibility of like, okay, I don't need to, to worry about reloading specifically in the, in the context of competition. Um, quite as often as you used to do in production. But I think that also opens up a lot of realization that, huh, you know, like in the real world, in the streets, you're going to run around, you know, and you're going to have a lot more bullets on board, you know, in your in your carry gear loadout than, than you might in you know, the way you practice production or the way you practice uh, IDPA practice, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that that was that was a that was an interesting realization. I think that made it far easier to compete in limited minor, right? You know, with essentially a production gun. But so yeah, that that was maybe my big takeaway from it. That's awesome. Yep, yep. Okay. Well, first I would like to say it really warms my heart the way Les and Scott and anybody else who said it, but I know you guys did. Uh, have said how much you enjoy shooting your carry gear from concealment. That's that that is a lot of what I, I love about it. And you know, to kind of pick up the thing that you left off with there, less about the reloads and the round count. That that's yet another of the of the things that has kept me from going to production, even though that's where my gun belongs and it's not really even juiced up enough for production. Um, that that is one of the things that's kept me there. I mean, it it is it is it, it's hard. You know, you do enough reload enough drills where you you know you're leaving a position so you reload right then man it, it, that i don't know if it's just me but that really afflicted me even in limited a little bit and um i, I can't even imagine you know the uh, what the translation would be with the artificiality of 10 round magazines played in you know used in the game and practicing a lot for that to probably a, a, a an increased number of involuntary unchosen reloads whoops i dropped the magazine because i started going somewhere and i really didn't need to with that 18 round gun or 22 round gun or something um that's that's another thing sorry total tangent but that's another thing that's kind of kept me away from production and wanted to stick wanting to stick with limited is not to warp my sense of round count and when i need to reload um so to answer uh the question though about what it what did I think was going to be hard and it wasn't. I, I kind of I think I kind of lack perspective on that because of just shooting the one gun and rig. Or you know, I, it's changed a little bit over time. It was you know a Gen three Glock thirty four. Now it's a Gen five G seventeen. But that's that's only a small amount of difference. Um, and I and once I switch, I you know just stick with it across the board. Um, so I, I kind of I think I kind of lack perspective because I don't know really what it's like to run around a stage and shoot a limited gun or some similarly, you know, very high performance uh, competition gun 
um, that I'm used to because I'm not used yeah. to any of those guns because I don't care about them. They're, they they don't interest me, and I don't have anything against them, but they just don't interest me, so I just don't use them. And sometimes people will say things to me like, "Oh gosh, you know, you did really good on that stage, and you know, I'd just love to see how would you do with like a, if what would ha- what would happen if we put a limited gun in your hands?" And and I already know the answer. The answer is I would do way worse because I'm not used to it and I have no interest in practicing <laughs> with it. So yeah. right, I mean, really. Yeah. So so the answer is I, I would do worse really yeah. um, until unless I practiced with it, which I wouldn't because I don't care. Um, But to kind of imagine some perspective. So, you know, the, I I think it's the trigger. So, you know, the, um, the giggles that people get when you first have them shoot like a suppressed gun or a full auto Mm -hmm. gun or something like that. And they kind of, they get the giggles of like, we, this is, (laughs) that's so awesome. And, and I get a lot the same thing when I'm, I'm like at the safety table, I'm going to dry fire or something. And there's somebody there and they've got their limited gun and they're like, here, try this. And I'm like, okay. And it was like this at Rogers. I like, like got to try Manny, Manny's um, limited gun that he was using. And, and it weighs like, I don't know, not really five pounds, but it felt like it weighed five pounds. And, and I go and I, you know, hold it on the, hold it on the target. And I go, you know, I touch the trigger and the hammer falls. The gun doesn't move at all. And yeah. I like, didn't do a trigger press. I just like touched it and began to increase pressure. And then there's, you know, no movement in the sights, hammer falls. And I got the same giggles. Right. And I get that every time I try a, a proper, you know, limited gun open gun very juiced up production gun that's got a a a very short light crisp trigger and and i'm like just get this thing away from me because it's going to ruin it for me ruin me for my real gun and it's not like i shoot a gun with a very difficult trigger that's absolutely not the case i shoot a gun with a modestly light trigger it's like a little it's near stock it's just barely lighter than stock by a tiny bit just cleaned up a little bit and um and it's not like it's a real challenging trigger but it is more challenging than those other triggers that I'm talking about. And I think, uh, I think that's the thing that, that I don't perceive the difference, but they're probably, I imagine that there probably is a difference, uh, especially when it comes to real difficult shots under pressure, you know, long shots, partial targets, you know, things, things at, at high, you know, harder targets at high speed, that kind of stuff where, where you, you, you gotta, you, you really gotta respect the trigger. Um, I think that, that that's, that's probably a, a difference that I just kind of is maybe there, but I fail to perceive it. Cool. I, I completely agree with Gabe. So I am not a person that buys guns often at all. Uh, I actually have very few guns for a person that shoots a lot and has, yeah, and instructs things like that. And one of the things I realized when people were asking me like, Oh, why don't you, you know, use something more gamey or something like that in some way, or, or one of those super sexy fucking five thousand dollar guns well because that's a lot of ammo (laughs) like i rather spend that five thousand dollars on ammunition personally like i shoot so much that i want to and and i see things as how much ammo is that like how much does that cost in ammo (laughs) that's literally how i see things i went to verizon i had to get a new phone because mine crapped out on me because it got super wet and sweaty Thanks, Florida. Um, but what ended up happening was it, it it broke, and I went there, and they were like, "Oh yeah, it's this much." I was like, "Man, that is like three cases of five five six. What can we do on that one?" <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like I I see things in ammo costs, and I get shit from like my buddies and stuff. They're like, "John, stop being a little bitch about it. Buy a thing. Buy this." And you know what? I end up just shooting what I have and and training with what i have which ends up just being all glocks because <laughs> that's what matters and uh sorry <laughs> sorry for red numbers uh <laughs> but but overall it just it it makes me uh more confident in my skills with what i use and what i carry and you know <laughs> let's be truthful what is most common in the united states and probably the world so not that I don't like trying other guns because shit, I have friends that have 40 something handguns and all different types, models, sexinesses and all that jazz. And I'll play with them. I'll try them out. I'll shoot them a little bit, but probably zero chance that I'm going to actually go ahead and buy one. Um, unless something comes out that's, that just blows my mind and, and, uh, and kills me on the whole Glock thing and makes me want to buy something different. But 
overall, it's it's literally just I'll train with what I carry and down to that kind of simplicity. But there's a lot to it, like Gabe was saying, like being able to to really understand that firearm, not just, oh, I know how to shoot it. But like, yeah, like on this, uh, my Glock at some point with this trigger, all, all the different intricacies about your own firearm that you learn after shooting 50K rounds through it. And you're like, oh, wow, this thing's like a piece of my hand. It's not just another firearm in my safe. So things like that, I, I kind of see more for me than buying a race gun so that I can keep up with the open guys um, in, in that manner. But I, I completely agree, Gabe. Like that's that's kind of like where my mind is at when it comes to the whole, uh, you know, get a race gun, bro. That's a lot of ammo. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think that um, everything boils down to logistics, right? I mean, what you can do boils down to your logistics. And I think that the one of, if not but really the, it's got to be the most foundational logistic is motivation, personal mm -hmm. motivation. That's it. Because if you're, if you're motivated enough, you'll figure out how to do X, whatever that is that you want to do. And if you're not, you're not going to figure it out. Right? It's motive, it's, it's personal motivation. And so, you know, to me, that's the controlling factor. And that's why, that's why I stick, have stuck with it the way I want to do it, because that's the only thing I personally care about. And it just, it, it's my feelings, man. Just, you know, I just got to go with my feelings. That's all. <laughs> Free country. I get to do what I want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. You know, I get that. I, I will say, you know, I think they're, hmm. you know, don't be, I should say this to, you know, not necessarily to John, but, but like, um, you know, there are a lot of cool things out there. It's, um, you know, I certainly like Glocks. I competed for a long time with Glock. I actually shot a Glock 40 in production uh, when I first started off, which is completely stupid. Why? And I, I'm almost like embarrassed to admit it. I didn't know anything about guns. So when I went to the gun store, I was like, hey, um, I want to buy a Glock. And they were like, well, you could buy a 9mm 40 or you know, 45. And looked at the 45 ammo. It was like horribly expensive. Looked at the 9mm ammo. It was completely confused because you've got subsonic, supersonic, 147, 124, 115, NATO, non-NATO, plus P, plus P, plus. And, and I was like, dude, but 40 only has two choices, you know, 165 grain, 180 grain. Yeah. <laughs> Give me the 40. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. Um, uh, you know, I am a simple man. Florida, right. <laughs> but, but it's like, you know, get, getting into it, like, um, I, I, I think it's cool to, like I've got a couple couple different guns, and you know, I enjoy shooting some of my revolvers, some of that stuff. You know, there, there's something that you do just for enjoyment. Like it's kind of cool. Hey, this is a neat thing to to tinker around with. And then there's the stuff which is like serious practice. Like, okay, we're gonna get down to brass tacks and and actually like do, you know, put in the real work and and make it happen. That that's you know there there's a context switch there too a little bit. So it's like you can have some fun, and then it's like okay, fun time is over. Now it's time to go to work. Um, you know, that's a mental distinction. I think a lot of people who are playing around in USPSA, and I, I would argue that more than half the people are just playing around in USPSA or IDPA. That, you know, it's something to do that's kind of fun, and they're you know, so they buy some stuff, buy some gear. Wow, that's sexy, or this is cool, or or whatever. Or, wow, that's whiz bang, that's tricked out. And, and, you know, the, the pursuit of, of, of that excellence is something that, um, you know, eludes them because of, of the fact that they're, they have no skin in the game. They have no, they, they haven't made that decision up here to say, damn, I am going to be really good. I, I, I demand to be really good. And the moment that somebody says that to themselves, I think this is when they get kind of, kind of, you know, they, they start getting on that path. That's cool. So. I love that there's room for for all of us in there. That that's yeah. something that I I really liked about USPSA. I mean, the USPSA in particular, I felt have, have felt so welcomed um, into for my motivation and you know and and I've I've come. I mean, I don't I don't think I was ever intolerant of people with a pure gaming motivation, but I'm now especially uh, tolerance, not even the right word, because that implies that I have a problem with it, but I, but I, you know, allow it to exist without criticism or something. I, I just don't even care. I mean, it's just, it's, that's great. You want to do it that way. Awesome, dude. That's fun. That's, 
cool. We're all out here shooting guns, and that's <laughs> rad. Yeah. You have a, a you do boo boo, you do you boo boo attitude, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. a lot of a lot of it is that is that I felt that you know directed at me, like people don't have a problem with me. So I mean, it's just you know that's great. So 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 here's another question, Ernie. If you didn't compete with your carry gear, what do you think you would have missed out on? Right. So, for example, Gabe has never gone from a completely gamer open drop offset rig. So it's going to be kind of hard for you to answer that. But, you know, like I'll get back to my my build drill thing. Right. If I didn't compete doing a sub two second build drill from concealment would have probably never crossed my mind as something that a I want to do B I want to do on demand. Right. So I'll give that to I'll give that to competition. So think about that, guys. What if you didn't compete with your carry gear? What do you think you would not have accomplished with it that you do I, now? I think I think I could tell you right now. I think mm -hmm. that uh, I probably would have accomplished probably none of the not probably any probably wouldn't have accomplished any of the notable things that I have accomplished with my carry gear from concealment. And, and that is because it feeds into the second part of, I think what you said there, which is, you know, this is one of the great values of competition. Um, and especially as a, 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 you know, concealed carry def self-defense person competing in, in that environment is that it's a, that is a, it is an honest, open environment. It's a real competition. Nobody is going to be compliant in your defeating them in the competition. Everybody wants to win or everybody who, you know, in the category of the people who are trying to win, they're all really trying. It's like, it, it's one of the things, it's like one of the things that's great about, about, you know, jujitsu or any, any art that, that encompasses honest resistance is, yeah, it's not a direct person versus person, you know, oppositional force contest, but people are really trying to win of the people who, who want to win. And that translates into a high level of motivation and logistical resources spent on practicing in order to be able to win and that translates into a very high bar of technical performance and existing in that world and allowing that bar to be your bar uh, creates a um, you know you're you're going to be like them in, in terms of your uh, your desire to practice and perform and get better and i think there's a i mean i think there's a um there's a, a phrase, there's a saying attributed to, I, I don't even really know anything about it, but there's a, there's a, I think a climbing guy named Mark Twight said something, something along the lines of, of, you know, without competition, it's really easy to, um, I may even have the wrong field. <laughs> He's a climbing guy, but it still applies that without competition, it's really easy to feel like you're going hard, but you're not. And you don't really know what that is until you get in an honest, open, narrowly focused technical skills contest. Um, and that makes it all the better, really, because uh, because, you know, the people in USPSA, lots of them aren't uh, necessarily tactical uh, practitioners. They aren't necessarily big self-defense people. And so they all the their logistical resources and motivation are focused on technical skills and performance and improvement. And uh, and so, you know, as a, as a self-defense person, you know, your interest is going to be somewhat more spread out and somewhat more diffused because, there's, as we all know, there's a lot more to self-defense than just technical skills performance. There's just is. Um, but by letting your uh, letting the technical skills bar be set by the people who are pure technical, purely oriented toward technical skills, that if you if you allow yourself to, to like Les said, have skin in the game, uh, be be open and honest in the competition, really try to win. That's going to drive you so much harder than if you just existed in your little insular um training environment only i'm sure there are some there are some exceptions there are probably you know some military units or somebody that's you know highly competitive within themselves but having more people involved it, it's it's going to raise the bar and and i think that if i had never got into it and all i were ever doing was just you know going to the range and doing what i did without the bar being set by open and honest technical skills competition among lots of people who really care about winning I can't imagine that I would have done any of the notable things that I've done. There you go. Follow that shit, Les. <laughs> With a <the> Beretta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
let me wake up first. No, I just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, to, to your criticism of me talking too much, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's, um, I think this is, you know, this is the important thing. I think this is why people organize competition, right? Um, because it, it's an honest, it's an honest, very human thing to do. Let's see who is better. Let's see what works better. You know, so there's the practitioners of competition and that, that is like, you know, that is hard to replicate or, or, you know, or you can't become another person, but their technique or their methodology or their, their training philosophy and all that stuff. And I mean, that is something that you can replicate. And that is something that if they're willing to share, then, then you can kind of get clued into it. So how do you create excellence? And I think this is a big, a big question, but, um, it's kind of tangential here, but, uh, but the point is, is that competition gives you those milestones, right? That those yeah. guideposts, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, for for what is objectively way better or way worse. And I mean, it's competitive barbecue. I mean, competitive pizza making, competitive shooting, uh, competitive. Sur I mean, all these practitioners and, and the the way they do it, there, there's something to it, right? Um, so how do you become among the best, or how do you become that top like? you know, God, like the top 10% or top 20% of that. Like, I mean, that, that's really, that's pretty neat to do. Um, so I, I think applied to shooting world, I think this is where you, right, is where you see people get better. I totally agree with G what Gabe said. So um, I think it's also interesting to see if you can replicate some of those things using carry gear, like to drive it back to that discussion. It's like, can you do it from concealment? Can you do it with what you're going to go out into the street with? And if you can't, maybe that's a clue, right? That maybe that five shot J frame, you know, isn't bad when you're going down to the stop and rob or whatever for milk at night. But, but, you know, if you're, you know, I mean, if you, if you shoot so much better with your full size gun or whatever, maybe you should be looking for a way to carry that. Maybe you should be looking for a way to, to maximize your effectiveness if you're going to carry for self-defense anyway. Right. So hey, maybe that's, a, that's food for thought right there. Yeah. Yep. How are you not in the primary and secondary groups when you come up with such a good concept? That's yeah. I'm. We've been, I'm, we've been preaching the same thing. It's a. It's. It's a great thought. I am protecting him right now. Okay. Wait. What? <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. I thought, I thought oh, yeah. I am in the primary secondary I, group. You're in firearms sure competition. Oh. You're. you're no, firearms you're in competition. Uh, you're not in the slums like the rest of us. I'm molding him. Oh. I'm getting him tougher. Before I release him into general pop, dude, <laughs> dude, that was part of Duty Project One Dot Like, no, 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 no. no. I'm talking about no, the two, di best. two dude, different I, things, dude. Two I, I, different, I, I, things. different type of Gen Pop. Yes. Yeah, are no, you guys talking about some things. kind of Facebook Facebook group or something? Yes, yeah. Gabe, you need to get oh, okay. on there to make more money. <laughs> but, uh, Maybe I should. Yeah, we should. Yeah. So, so Chuck, Chuck, speaking of J frames, dude, what do you think about all that, man? So the, the, I don't know if you heard the question, but the question is, is what have you accomplished by shooting competition with your carry gear that you don't think you would have accomplished otherwise? Uh, pretty much what the other guys have already noted is, uh, you know, if I had never gone to a competition like USPSA, stuff like that, and I just stayed in just the comp world, let's say, um, you know, in, in, in my, I was a big fish in a small pond. I was uh, uh, generally considered to be really, really good shot. And then I get into USPSA and not so much. Uh, I wouldn't have an idea of what good is because I would have never seen it. Uh, I would not have a realistic idea of exactly how good good is. Um, and that that is something to strive for. Uh, that quote that uh, Gabe was uh, trying to pull out, that's uh, uh, Twight's quote. It's uh, the book, I believe, is Extreme Alpinism, is you can't go as deep in training as you can in a fight or competition. You think you're going hard, you're not. Um, so the, the competition the competition is a test. You can use that to test things. Um, and that, you know... Uh, my my in, initial introduction into competition shooting was a real wake up call in how good good is, 
and then how much I needed to work on my skills. Uh, that's that's what I would not have gotten if I hadn't gotten into competition. Yep. Mine comes down to uh, confidence, pure and utter confidence in abilities, the equipment I've chosen, how I choose to carry things, and the ability to know that I can turn, you know, go to a, go to a match because I shoot about one match a month if I'm lucky, and know that I can meet my standard that I hold for myself. And if there's something that I'm working on specifically to get better on to see if I'm gaining ground in those areas. But at the end of the day, for me, I'm not shooting matches to win. I'm shooting it to continually build the confidence that I have in myself and the equipment that I have. Until you get good enough to win. <laughs> it's a game. It's a game at the end of the day for me. And, you know, carrying a gun is, is a, a higher responsibility that I put at a, a different level. And, you know, some days you have off days on matches. Some days you shoot really, really good. But looking at overall consistency of performance on demand, I think for me, and this is, again, speaking for me only, is a more important priority than winning a game. This is Sure. <laughs> I, I think it's been I think it's been really funny for me how different circumstances in within competition like classifiers depending on how close I am or am not to moving up or a great score dropping off and I'm gonna you know lose it and it's gonna take months or a year to you know work to claw my way back to where I was actually that's I think that's where I am right now I've got I'm like I don't know three and a half percent away from GM or something like that and that could literally be five years away because the next one to drop off is a hundred and that's going to be, you know, unless I shoot a hundred to replace it, then th it's going to go downhill and it could be, it, could, it just, you know, it, it, that's just how it is. Um, it's just, just a super high bar of performance. And, uh, but, but where I've been the most stressed in competition is when there's a very, very real possibility of moving up or moving down or something like that. You know, the, the win is within your grasp or whatever it is. That's when the stress is really on. It's not when look, I'm at area one and, you know, the best I've done is 50, whatever it was, 15th place or something there is, and there's no way I'm going to like just win it. It's just, you know, I got to be realistic. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try, but, you know, there's no way uh, that that's that I'm even realistically there because, you know, a winner of an area match is like that's like a contender at nationals. And, and that's not where I'm at. Um, you know, that's okay, but that's, it's not where I'm at. But then in that way, there's less stress. But then if there's some threshold or something that's within my grasp, like, wow, you know, looking at the scores, gosh, I could like, you know, be, I maybe win M or something, or I could be close to it or something like that, or maybe do better than I've done before, you know, something that you want. That's when the stress is on for me. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, 9106 to be clear, Gabe. 9106. That's, that's where I am. That, that's, that's where you're at. Oh, thanks. Okay. <laughs> yep. It's been a while since I've looked. <laughs> so, so for me, uh, so for me, for uh, competition, or at least what competition has done for me compared to what it may not have done if I or if I didn't do it in the first place, was uh, was being able to process and act on things more efficiently. So um, being on or, or coming from a tactical side, per se, um, it was about being, you know, efficient and, and processing things because you have to process things before you actually act on them. Um, and just like most games, right? Like you, you play any kind of game, you have to process what's going on before you make an action of some sort. Uh, same thing goes back to the good old OODA loop uh, kind of uh, understanding. But competition has heightened those senses or made them more efficient in the long run. And, uh, and that's something that I think I wouldn't have gotten as good at until, or since I got into competition, if I didn't, then it would have been, uh, you know, a longer process where I would have had to experience more things. I would say like more real world things when in competition, I didn't have to experience real world things but I was able to do all those things in practice that made it better in reality. Does that, does that make sense? Yep. Um, yeah, that reminds the, me of something. Oh, I'm sorry. No, well, uh, the, the other thing uh, that it does was helping to control emotions. 
So um, a lot of people get all uh, crazy about their emotions when, when they're competing or when they're in a life and death situation, right? Their emotions are, are flaring, whether they're angry, sad, happy, over exaggerate, they're, they're overly happy in some way, Wh whatever it is that their emotions will, will actually show and or be exacerbated to the extent that they're going to perform differently, right? So let's say you, you have a really shit stage. Guess what? If you're like, fuck, that sucks. I hate myself. My gun sucks. My gear sucks. My dick sucks. Whatever it is. Either way. <laughs> wow. <laughs> What ends up happening is the rest of your your day or your night or whatever you're shooting ends up pretty bad, right? You mentally have lost the game, so physically you end up losing the game. Um, so doing competition or, or competing in general with whatever, whether it's shooting or, or you're playing basketball or whatever, uh, learning how to control those emotions while you're playing the game or, or at least understanding your emotions while you're playing the game to better yourself in the long run, right? Like, oh man, the second I got upset, I started doing really bad. Or, hey, I got overly happy and overly confident, I started doing bad. I need to find my happy medium so that I could stay level-headed, keep my head in the game, and rock on. So same thing in anything that I would do self-defense-wise or or combat-wise. If I was in, in an actual, you know, Muja's casa freaking knocking down shit and doing some work and i got overly confident or overly angry i may make a mistake that cost me or my buddy's lives so things like that kind of those those things i think competition helped me um correlate to my life a little easier and and give me that ability to understand emotions a little bit better so um those are the two things that i realized competition did for me that I probably wouldn't have had without it. Um, and then the other thing I think a lot of people miss out on is is uh, shooting with somebody that's better than you, right? Or doing something that they're better at than you are gets you better. Like <laughs> if you shoot with with lesser shooters, like like Chuck was saying, or I hate to say lesser shooters, but he was big fish in the small pond with his department or Leo organization. Well. Guess what? Yeah, he's he's awesome at that level, but he never knew what level he can get to or what's higher above him because he was always shooting with shooters that were lesser in skill, I, I would say. Um, and, and that made him feel like, oh, yeah, I'm awesome. But then again, it's a competition and he's at the bottom of the barrel again. And yep. I think yep. that happens. Most of us that were tactical shooters that went into competition or something like that, too. But yeah. that's, that's another thing that kind of comes into play. Yeah, and I think that's a huge point, right? I always say this, uh, or I mostly say it in my classes and stuff. It's like, look, for those of you guys that are going to classes and stuff, and you've got a 10, 14, 16, 20-person class, if you say you're not comparing yourself against someone else in that class, you're a liar. Stop it, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? And that said, you know, when you compete, you know, uh, it wasn't for my current schedule, you know, I was competing like eight times a month. And that could be anywhere between against 20 to, if it's a major, 300 other people, right? And what that leads to is you uh, shattering your glass ceilings, yeah. right? And I, and I really think that's that's the thing. It's like, how is, you know, like in, in one of the other modcasts we did, you know, uh, I think it was Mike Pannone who said, "Is like, yeah, you're going to go and you're going to get your glass ceiling shattered. And it's going to be by the 60-year-old guy who had to put down his oxygen mask to kick your ass. <laughs> right? and, and, that's and that's, that. Yeah, and, and that's the thing that you're going to learn. And, and you're going to say, well, if that guy can do that, why can't I do that and not make excuses to do it? And you learn so many things. It's... You know, I mean, like before, I mean, yeah, when I was in football, I, I heard of like chop stepping into before you make a direction. I've heard of drop steps. I've heard, you know, blah, blah, blah. And in the tactical world, you always hear of from very notable guys, sooner, not faster. But the definitions can get kind of vague. And then you watch guys compete. Oh, yeah, they're aiming through the barricade. So as soon as their sights are on target, boom, it's there. They are leaning out of position on an open target to get the momentum going before 
they had before that second shot breaks. Um, I, I will tell you my last experience. Um, you know, I think most everybody here I've shot with in person, uh, Matt seen me shoot. I haven't shot with Chuck, but you know what? My recoil control is pretty good. I think it is nothing compared to Steggers. Dude, watching him do his pair drill at 25 yards. Holy shit. He's a machine. And a, oh, dude. At 25 yards, three inch groups, pop, 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 pop. And then he looks at me and he knows exactly what I'm thinking. I was like, oh, that's great, dude, with your fucking seven pound Tamfo. Right. I actually wasn't thinking that, but I kind of was in a way. <laughs> right. You know? And he goes, oh, give me your gun. Pop, 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 pop. And of course, he shoots it better than I do. That's usually my shtick, right? Let me give you your gun. I'll shoot you. I'll shoot it better than you can shoot you. He took that thing and it was like, and he goes, huh, I might actually shoot faster with your gun. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Can we get back my fucking gun? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and just, you know, I mean, training with like, I, I, I shoot with guys out here like Ron Francisco, Dave Wampler, uh, Matt Olichek, just guys, just awesome guys that, it's like, what in the hell, man? You are not, you are not these bastions of physical uh, perfection. And you're beating me by two seconds on a stage. Cause that, that you know, but that that's the whole thing. You know, the, the old like bromide here is that, you know, uh, foot speed doesn't win matches and, and all this stuff. And, it's not it's not a bromide it's like we'll say a truism more so but it, it kind of yeah, i mean as, as long as you're in reasonable shape it's you know how you perceive the sights and press the trigger and you know do all the things that are the fundamentals of shooting um that that's really that's what wins that's what gets points right right gabe i mean that's what especially in minor that's what you need is points yep and, um and that, that, that's what you're going after. That is the point of the competition is to um, get your points and do it quickly. And, you know, um, physical fitness has very little bearing as long as you're not infirm or something like that where you can't grip the gun anymore or something. You know, we've got a couple really old guys that shoot up here in northern Illinois. And, um, and I mean, they're, they're starting to give up a lot in terms of grip and, and just general, like, physical like i mean they have a hard time just getting around now it's it's kind of sucks to see because these are the guys that got me into the competition and uh, it's like uh but uh that's not good news but, but um, they're still beating the guys that are just coming into the sport yeah yeah you know and that's an amazing thing i mean i'm learning things now like like i got my uh i got an agility thing from uh branded powers yeah right, right. he's talking to me about the pent ultimate step for the audience out there, the pentatonic step is the the second to last step, which is actually more important than your last step. You really think I would have even heard about that shit if I wasn't competing? You know, I I, <laughs> I, I think you know, and that this is this is one of those things where it's like a lot of the stuff like that is also important, right? That that is also a a stone to overturn and this is the this is the big thing in the path towards excellence you want to leave no stone unturned right before you you can accrue it all that that's that's a big deal right i mean i know gabe lost a lot of weight um good job man hell yeah and um I, did it help you with your shooting was it easier to to go out and do a, a match day as a result of that well it wasn't that much weight but i found it i found it easier to um um, you know, jump around like a puma on on the stage. You know, uh, there was there was a stage right after um, right after I did lose that weight uh, that had one of those uh, unstable bridge platform things. Yeah. And uh, and and it's like the, the 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 two big matches, like the state match and the area match that I shot uh, right after that, having lost, I think actually I did lo lose like thirty five pounds. Um, was it, it? It was really fun because the stages were just set up perfectly that I could. You know, it was like leap through the air, land on the thing, land as stably as possible, shoot, shoot. There was even one, it was like probably the single funnest moment I've ever had in USPSA when it was set, the circumstances were just right, that it was a legitimate game decision and a doable physical thing to leap off the unstable bridge, shoot a target while I was in the air and then land in the box and then finish shooting. 
And that was really cool. That was like a funnest, funnest moment ever. Damn. Damn, Kato. It, it was it was really close. It was like it was, you know, it was like a three yard target or something. So it all added up. It was perfect. It wasn't a crazy thing to do. It was it was like, no, this actually fits. But uh um, you know, I, if I can play off of a couple things that people said, there's so much good stuff right here. Um, you know, back to John, I thought what you said, really what everybody said, but, but the things that you said were, I thought, very profound. Um, I'll shamelessly quote Matt Little because he has a lot of real experience that I don't. Um, but he said a lot of the same thing that you said about processing speed is that uh, I've seen him say that uh, his CQB has done nothing for his gaming but his gaming does a lot for his CQB. And yes. I won't try mm -hmm. to explain that more, but that was his, you know, encapsulation there. And, and this next one is something that I have definitely felt a lot as a benefit of competition, especially as a, you know, as a self, as a non, non real world experience, self-defense guy is that, is that emotional control? And I, I heard it from my mentor. Um, I, it is what I fr would phrase as the key piece of advice uh, to, you know, to do well on the Rogers test, which is you must remain mentally composed and focused on cleanly completing the task at hand. That's the only way forward. All the yeah. other things that you might feel, you might think about, the feelings that you have, exactly what you're saying, whatever form those take for an individual person, those are the way to become folded in upon yourself. And you instead need to turn your awareness outward and focus on the solutions. And most specifically, remain mentally composed and focused on cleanly completing this task at hand, the one right now. And ironically, you know, with the unfortunate separate cultural separation to the extent there is one between the tactical and, and competitive worlds, I think that that's a, an incredible irony of that separation is that, you know, for me as a self-defense guy that knock on wood, doesn't shoot for blood. Um, you know, I, uh, the, the most on-demand circumstance I have is competition. I mean, that is no shit. I mean, in competition, you're going to go there and you're going to shoot and you're going to get one chance. And no, you don't get to reshoot. And no, that really was how good you were. That, what you did, that's it. That's how well you were prepared to do. And that's what you did. And now the scores will all be posted very publicly for everyone to review and you're going to live with it. And that's a, that's a great thing. That's just such a powerful mm -hmm. thing about competition is, you know, if I were just like in the little cave of the range and, you know, doing my own thing, wouldn't have that level of accountability and review and thus not have the pressure of on-demand performance that it that the competition creates yeah, yeah absolutely cool well based on what also john said about the emotional response to that i've i've seen that in cops on qualifications i think that also might be Part of the reason why a lot of them don't want to compete. No, I think it's because they don't want to be outshot. Okay. <laughs> you got to get Matt Little, by the way, on on one of these podcasts. People people got to get to know him because he is a he is a great dude. Um, yeah, he is outstanding um, individual. Yes, he is. He's uh, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. Just we, we got to get him into primary secondary or whatever too is uh he'd be he'd be a really hellaciously good resource i've been trying to like kick his ass to post more up on uh pistol forum and all that too but um, uh, I'll, I'll 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 get him on here for those of you that don't know matt i mean I, I don't think it's unfair to tell his story even though he's here so uh long time uh was he was he a ranger for a little bit then he went sf or something so special operations army guy let's just say yeah. that right uh, lifelong martial artist. Uh, my conversations with him about martial arts have gone way nerd fast, man. It was, it's been awesome. Uh, and he is currently the, is he the head instructor weapons and tactics for Chicago SWAT? Yeah. He's a training sergeant for Chicago, Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. Chicago and SWAT. currently he is on an all encompassing, uh, Earth, you know, uh, burned earth uh, quest to make GM. And right now, Matt is, I hope he doesn't get mad at me for saying this, but Matt right now is He's a 90, yeah, 91.7 yeah. in, in, in production. Actually, the funny story about Matt, he's like, God damn it, Jedi. I went to this, I went to this classifier match and I didn't check what I did. And I was a GM for like six seconds. Yep. 
because I shot one stage and didn't think I did well and got like a 97 and then went directly to the next stage because they were two short uh, classifiers and got an 82. <laughs> yep. Yep. So he made GM and lost it right then and there, man. Uh, yeah, uh, I heard that story too, man. <laughs> Matt was Matt, such an awesome dude. I got to meet him in the the McHenry class last year. What an awesome shooter, an awesome dude. It was just such a pleasure and honor to get to meet and train with him for a couple of days. I uh, should see him when I go back in December. So I'm really uh, really looking forward to that. Is it Graybeard actual? That yes. that's him. That's Matt. So yeah, he's uh. He's got some stories about getting into competition. He had a mutual friend, also from I think Chicago SWAT, before he I think he retired from the department. I, I, I'm not exactly sure, but um, that guy was that's Pete Milionis, who's a hellacious USPSA shooter. Uh, he does a lot of instruction around here in Chicagoland, and, uh, and he's the guy that really got Matt. I, I think also Frank Proctor. They had known each other, I think, from. I don't want to speak for Matt, but I think it is because they were both in the military at the same time. And then Frank and Pete were like, look, dude, you got to do this. You just you got to shut up and go do this. And then, and then we pretty much ruined him. Oh, the McHenry club is, uh, is great. Uh, you know, with, with all the guys like Max Clatt and everybody. And, uh, Oh, we just, yeah, it, it was, I, I think he, he, he went there. I think the, the best phrase to, to describe Matt's experience was probably he got his shit pushed in. Yeah, there you go. So. There it is, man. It's <laughs> that a technical was, term. It's yeah. a technical term. <laughs> I think the, the other technical term is the soul crushing junk punch. And that, that's that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that was, that was it, man. But, uh, but yeah, we, uh, you know, we got him, we got him on the right path. Uh, that's good stuff. But I just, I just, I, I love watching Matt shoot, dude. It's just so goddamn angry. <laughs> it's just so angry. He's lightened up a lot, um, which is good. No, it's not good, dude, because I love him angry, bro. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know, the, <laughs> he mitigated the Hulk anger, like, you know, uh, like Hulk smash, you know, but uh, that, that's that's kind of the, the retard Rhea stat has been turned down a few uh, notches. Good, dude, good stuff like in his way. He just. He just snatches that gun back like I'm like, like, bro, you're snatching that gun back like it owes you money. It does owe me money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, That's awesome. Oh, it is. Dude. I love yeah, that dude, dude, man. Oh my God. Yeah. He is awesome. Uh, well, should we wrap it up? I, I think so. We'll have more. Okay. Because no, I do I have the one final question, and yeah. Chuck needs to go to bed and get tucked in, so we can't keep him out too late. He has an early morning. Yeah, so ask him first. Yeah. So, Chuck, when it comes to your EDC competition stuff, what is it that you're carrying? What weapon? Uh, what holster? What, all that kind of stuff, and is there anything specific about it that you especially like and why? Um. Currently, I've distilled all my serious guns down. I mean, Les was talking about you have some fun stuff. All my serious guns are Glock 9 millimeters and Snubnose 38s. Uh, I carry a backup gun at work. Um, and, of course, that's where the snub noses fall into. And uh, my duty guns, my concealed carry guns are all Glock 9 millimeters, either a G17 or a G19, depending on... Um, you know, if I'm on duty, off duty, what I'm wearing, how I'm wearing it, that kind of thing. I do have a, a 43 that I'm playing around with for gym shorts gun, mowing the yard gun, things like that. But uh, off duty, on duty carrying Safari Land gear. Uh, Safari Land's making the best police holsters in history right now. Yep. Um, yep. I, uh, <laughs> people, People kind of get a case of the ass with certain companies and then just bash on them and stuff. And I've had some corporate dealings with Safari Land and made me less than happy with like British Aerospace, which was their holding company. Um, but anyway, they make duty holsters uh, that have ever been created. Hey, man. Uh, my, uh, my concealed carry gear is all uh, currently Darkstar gear, uh, Keepers or Filster. 
Um, I really like all those guys' gear, and I have tried it out, played with it, taken it to competition, taken it to classes. Uh, currently, have some of it loaned out, so I'm carrying a uh, keepers or a dark star gear right now because I've got like five or six of my appendix holsters loaned out. Uh, really like those holsters. Uh, they're both built by guys who um, they're not just in the holster building business. They've been to competition. They've been to classes. Uh, you know, I believe uh, both Tom and Spencer have been to uh, ECQC, trained with Craig Douglas, things like that. Pressure tested their gear, uh, which I really like. Uh, when I was at, it was recently a Gabe's class like a month or two ago, and I was shooting uh, most of that class from my keeper's concealment holster. Um, that's kind of the, the way Spencer's got it set up. It's kind of a race holster of concealment holsters. It's a really fast holster, but then it's very comfortable as well because, you know, I've, I've been working, uh, I work a 24 hour shift. I've been working and wearing that holster 16, 18 hours at a time. I've been on road trips, things like that. Really comfortable gear. Um, so, you know, I might be carrying a 19 or a 17. Uh, I might add a snub 38 to that, but that's, I've distilled, I sold my 40, sold my 45, sold my 1911s a long time ago. I, I hit some HKs for a while, Smith and Wessons. I've got Glock nine millimeters now. That's pretty much it. Cool. Yeah. And having holsters made by, well, number one, Safariland, their track record's awesome. And I've been using them for eh, 20 years now. But having custom made stuff from people that actually train versus some garage bender, that that means a lot. There's a lot of thought to them. Yeah, pressure pressure testing your gear, um, responding to empirical evidence and feedback. Uh, those guys have worn it. They've loaned it out. Uh, had people test it, they want honest feedback on their gear, and then uh, you know modify the gear, things like that. That uh, that really dials the gear in, I think. Oh, absolutely. Oh, and before I imagine you're probably going to need to take off soon. Is there anything that you want to plug? Um, well, I'm wearing my Dark Star gear shirt tonight. Um, uh, the, the, him at Tom, Tom and Spencer have been really good dudes to work with. Uh, John over at Philster have been really good dudes to work with as far as holsters. Um, as far as like my own stuff, I've got some stuff up on my site, uh, www.agiletactical.com. Um, my training uh, calendar is a little uh, sparse this year. Year because I'm working so much, I'm, I can foresee that opening up next year. Uh, I should have a bit of a job change going on, um, but I've got some classes. I've got a class that's uh, starting to fill up uh, FPF Tactical with John Murphy, and that's next month. Uh, I'm going to be in uh, Pennsylvania at Annette Evans Race Street Range in November. I'm going to be uh, working with, very privileged to work with uh, Wayne Dobbs and uh, Daryl Bolke. Mark Freaky at Revolver Roundup down in Dallas in September and uh, looking at some classes with Cecil Birch and uh, uh, things like that next year. So I'm hoping to, hoping to pack my training calendar a bit better. Cool. Cool. Adam, how about you? What you carrying? Why? What's working really well for you? Uh, so I carry day in, day out a uh, Glock 34 with a Surefire X300A. Uh, Doug did the slide. So front and rear cock insulation. Yeah, ATE, I did the slide. Uh, an RM06 on it. Uh, it flips between a Filster Spotlight or a Dark Star gear. I'm waiting for Tom to release the X300 uh, G34 length just because that's what I carry. I like carrying long guns. They're they're more comfortable than carrying 19s or 43s. Mm -hmm. um, so I carry that, and I don't do a re I don't carry a reload right now. I'm waiting on Jam to ship their high rise mag pouch. So 
Um, but yeah, not that's generally what I carry every day. Sometimes I'll bump down to I have a grip chop 17 that I'll carry. Uh how's, that, my, uh, how's that holster modified though, bro, bro? Oh yeah, no, I showed it earlier. Uh it's got uh, a Jedi yoga block modification on it, which is really, really nice. Um, which could be a pillow. It, it rests so comfortably on my junk. It's insane. But yeah, um, I like Tom has been a long friend. Like we go back to like paintball days. So uh, I've known Tom for a long time and his attention to detail and not releasing something till it's absolutely perfect. Uh, with Dark Star gear is uh, is admirable, and it's something that I enjoy. I also like the one big overclip that he does, and then um, John Houtman at Filster. Uh, the spotlight I think is probably the best appendix light bearing holster on the market. Um, it fits great. It rides great. Um, yeah, so that, that that's where I'm at. Um, nothing too crazy. Nothing out of this world, I guess. And what you have to plug? Um, everybody knows I work at Knight's Armament. Uh, you can check us out uh, at our website, knightarmco.com. Uh, I'm Adam underscore Peeney. Um, I'm excited to do some training. I'm actually lucked out that Scott got me in with Gabe when he comes down here to Florida. So I'm super stoked to do that class. And me too, yeah, man. I'm so glad to meet you. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I was telling the story earlier. I'm at Scott's class and he kept saying your name. And I'm, I'm thinking in my head, like, I don't know who the fuck this guy is. And then midway through, he keeps, say, he keeps saying your name. He's like, gay boy does this and gay boy does that. And I'm, I, I stick my hand out. I'm like, you say this like I'm supposed to know who the fuck this guy is. And everybody looks at me like I'm insane. And he's like, <laughs> get on your fucking phone right now. So I'm looking at you shooting golf balls on the move. I'm like, how do I do this? How do I, how do I get this guy's class? And I saw you were coming to – Lakeland, which is where my girlfriend lives. So I'm like, oh, rad, convenient. And I put myself on the wait list and then Scott called me. He's like, you're in, you need to pay. And I was like, hallelujah. <laughs> so yeah, that's, awesome. that's, uh, that's the only, I got, I think two classes for the rest of the year, but that yours is the only one I'm really looking forward to just because work, like shooting rifles, I've done it for so long and I, I do it for work so much that handguns are really the focus of like at least my shooting um, palette lately and getting better at shooting appendix and getting more efficient and getting faster and getting better with a handgun is, is really my primary goal. Cool. John, how about you? Uh, so currently I'm, uh, I'm going between two different, uh, Glocks essentially the 19 and the 17. Uh, my 19, just like Peeny was saying, like, Longer guns seem to be a little more comfy. Um, and if you want to uh, nerd out on that later, I'll tell you why that works. Like, we can get down real gritty with that. Oh, uh, probably. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it moves, it, it sits next to your junk instead of on top yeah. of it, pinching it. I think that's what it is. Um, Highly inappropriate. <laughs> Highly inappropriate. I did hands, I, I didn't do like tubular objects or anything. Um, <laughs> It's like, what's he fucking? It's like milking something. He's like, hey, I got nipples. Can you milk me? What the fuck is that? Hey, he's South Frank. Florida. We don't claim South Florida up here. So um, <laughs> there's nothing clean that comes out of my mouth, apparently. Uh, so, exactly. whole, <laughs> so I've been using a 19 with a comp on it. I carry an agency arms, full build, uh, agency comp, everything. Um, I'm, I'm about that dot life. So... <laughs> If it doesn't have a dot on it, I don't like shooting it as much. I do still shoot it. Um, and I do still like shooting irons to an extent. Um, and then uh, the 17, I just, just a plain old 17 agency styled up with a dot on it. And I carry, I don't carry guns without lights, whether it's my rifle or handguns. I, I think it's stupid. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then I carry in Armadillo Concealment Lux, which I helped de develop and name, which was awesome and gives me gives me joy. So that's why uh, I kind of stick with that for the most part. But I have tried a lot of different holsters uh, in my time. And then uh, and then my mag pouch, I carry one spare mag on me, and it's usually like a pretty long 17 with with a plus five or six or ando tells everybody it is uh, whatever fits in there pretty much 
Um, but yeah, that's pretty much what I've been carrying for a while, and I'm happy with them. And you're plugging? Oh, well, um, uh, next weekend, I have a class down here in uh, Homestead, Florida. It's uh, Pistol 1 and 2, uh, Pistol Mechanics. Uh, so it's my flavor on how to be more efficient with your with your handgun, essentially. And uh, and then I have a class at the end of the month in California, the 28th and I think 29th, uh, in Cali, in Moore Park. And uh, that'll be my first Cali class that I actually do. It's kind of cool going over... <laughs> going over the border and uh but i did live out there for a little bit when i was working out there so no is, it op- is it open or la only no it's open it's where's open more where's more, pa- where's more park at more parks uh, a little bit outside of la hmm. so it's like 20 minutes north of compton Bank area i think it is but no, no not compton but that would be a really <laughs> cool class too um it would be <laughs> How to fuck live fire. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, you can see any of my classes on uh, on my website, kinetic-consulting.net, and then uh, or you can see any of the Sage classes between Aaron and I, uh, between any of our classes or the ones we're actually both teaching at the same time, which is super fun to have because you get both of our flavors. Um, and those you'll see on sagedynamics.org. Cool. Sure. Scott. Uh, so, so the competition wise right now, everybody knows that my carry gun is my competition gun. It is a gen four, uh, uh, Glock 34 done up by agency, uh, with an RMR 06, six. Um, we're going to finish out this season, uh, with my, uh, competition rig, which is a, uh, tough sport, uh, tough sports, uh, Tough, tough products, product. yeah, tough, sorry. Tough products, uh, uh, belts, CR speed pouches, and a Red Hill tactical drop offset uh, holster. Um, the times that I have competed uh, in open with that gun, because with a dot, you go appendix, you have to shoot open. Uh, it has been with my carry uh, rig, which is a Filster Spotlight X300U, and um, I am I am messing around with different configurations uh, with the uh, mag pouch since, and I guess I can say this, dude, because nobody's heard from the guy, Steve from Persec Systems and his Mark Seven uh, mag pouch. The dude has fallen off the face of the earth. Maybe this will yes. wake him up, right? Uh, that was, uh, you know, I guys, in all full disclosure, I'm sponsored by Filster. John Hopman is. Uh, the salt of the earth, Great um, guy. but that mag pouch for me was the best, the best. And nobody can, nobody knows where the hell Steve went, you know, anyway. Uh, so, uh, I'm experimenting with John's stuff, trying to get it at the right cant. Uh, I'm experimenting with, uh, the Nick Kydex holster. I'm sorry, the Nick's Kydex pouch, which, uh, kind of works. And when I shoot open, uh, I have a little bit of a secret weapon that I can't disclose because of NDAs, but it doesn't put pepper me spray. at a disadvantage. Uh, it doesn't, yeah, exactly. It doesn't put me at, uh, I only use pepper spray IDPA matches. Okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully in the next year or so, guys, if you want to go concealment, a lo- very large manufacturer will finally release their large their large 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 capacity magazine for glocks so which is uspsa compliant when they release it so uh that's my gig uh what else do i have that i'm pitching uh i got a one day advanced red dot in richmond virginia on the 21st then i'll be teaching a two day at uh, alliance police training on the 28th and 29th uh guys if you want to make that class hurry up there's only like four spots left that class is going to be awesome. Uh, dudes like uh, Corey Hupp are going to be there. Uh, um, Michael Grosso of LA Sheriff's Department, Medal of Valor, and technical advisor for the movie Heat will be there. Uh, and uh, Bruce Gray will be there. So it's going to be an awesome, awesome class. Plus, it's the Hawaii of the Midwest, man. Let's go shoot on some hollowed ground there. Uh, that's July. 
August. I got Janesville, uh, uh, Minnesota. That's going to be awesome. Um, and then Friends of Pat at the end of August. I'm pretty sure that's happening. And then somewhere in there, I think Thursday, I'm going to be shooting Area 8. Hey, guys. Hey, guess uh, uh, Les and uh, um, uh, Gabe, guess who's on my squad for Area 8? Who? Ben? Yeah, Shane Coley. Oh, <laughs> all right. I, I am so going nice. to get kicked off by agency. That guy's going to go, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and Ashley Rourke. Oh, she's awesome. awesome. Dude, and she's yeah. shooting carry optics. Nice. I'm gonna get my learn on to those two, man. So that's gonna that's gonna be a good time. And then uh at the end of August, actually the beginning of September, uh, I'll be down in Okeechobee, Florida. Hey dude, how far do you live from Okeechobee? Less. Uh I'm like in an hour and a half. You wanna count you, you know that you know it is the postponed one. You wanna come up, bro? Probably. Both of you, both of you, bros, you Florida bros. All three oh, am, Florida am I bros. not in that too? <laughs> I said all of you Florida bros. When when did you say it was? It's uh, September first and second. Uh, Gabe, when are you down here? Well, uh, <clears throat> September. Let me see. I'm going to call it right here. It's, uh, the class you're in is September 29th and 30th. Oh, okay, there you go. Cool. There you go. Just show up. Just like yep. you guys always do, just show up, fuckers. Anyway. Oh man, we can't. He's starting to get that Asian lush. We got to calm him down with the drinking. <laughs> no more sake for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's Lacroix water. What are you talking about? Sure. Yeah, sure. we've seen that bottle you've been pouring in. Yeah, this thing's awesome, man. Anyway, Suntory time. <laughs> Yeah, so that's what's going on with me, man. So cool, good stuff. Gabe, how about you? Um, let's see. So, what was the question? What am I carrying? So, I carry a Gen Five Glock Seventeen that is largely but not completely stock. It's got a um, a the extended mag catch, like the FBI mid length one. It's got a non weighted Glockmeister grip plug that kind of acts like a one quarter magwell. It has the factory minus connector and a five pound wolf striker spring. And yes, I have carefully vetted it for ignition reliability. Um, and it's got the, uh, the, the factory option Ameriglo gold sights. Cause I wanted to get with the, I uh, wanted to try the, try some of the real high visibility breed of night sights again, having spent some years with plain with, with all blacks and then um, fiber optics. I wanted to, wanted to give some of the, you know, more modern night sights to try again. And I've been liking those pretty well. Um, so that's that gun and uh, carry it in a keeper's appendix holster at uh, about 1230 between the groin and thigh. Um, and that's set up for a straight drop and in the highest ride configuration because it conceals well enough and uh, definitely agree with what uh, Chuck said earlier that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a limited race rig built for concealment. It's approximately that, so very good there. Um, and then I carry uh, two uh, JM Custom Kydex uh, single pistol magazine pouches, uh, the high ride version with uh, OEM 17 round Glock magazines. Um, and those are, uh, actually I've kind of modified those a little bit. I have, I have them stuck together with Velcro so that they don't, uh, shift as much. Um, and I also put a big wedge on them because that helps the concealment as well. And I forgot to mention the raging mega huge, uh, wedge that I put on the, uh, that I use on the keepers holster as well. That's a really important part of appendix carry for me personally. Um, and those mag pouches are pretty much at like 12 o'clock and maybe 1145. And then at about 1130, uh, right next to the mag pouch crammed right up against it, I carry a Spyderco reverse um, set up for, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little, it's, it's set up for reverse edge, uh, like is, is common in, in the, you know, TPI circles uh, that I'm a part of as well. And, um, but, but different orientation, a lot of those guys run uh, the handle down tip up and I do the kind of the reverse because I'm, 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 I'm so heavily on the, uh, the, the gun and appendix carry that, that uh, this is a knife, a sheath, and a carry position and method that doesn't interfere with my gun stuff at all. Um, and and I, that's, that's the main reason I select that specific thing um, along with that position. 
so uh let's see uh you know i mean you and then I carry usually carry uh, when I say usually I carry a Glock 26 backup, um, either left front pocket or previously ankle, but uh, my ankles needed a break, so I switched to a left front pocket, and uh, carry a uh, uh, you know, a little Wave Spyderco Delica, Delica in the right back pocket. Uh, that's my we'll get it out in front of people and open stuff knife, and uh, and a uh, tourniquet in the right front pocket, a couple of flashlights, and uh, that's what I carry, and. Um, as far as stuff coming up, I got you, you the, the short answer is you can check out my training schedule at my website, GabeWhiteTraining.com. But uh, to just, you know, plug the classes that have a bunch of room in them and certainly can uh, use people that are interested. Um, November 3rd and 4th, I've got a class coming up at Shoot Logic in Reevesville, South Carolina. That one's got a bunch of room in it. Uh, I'd love to see people there. And then in, uh, let's see, next February, I'm in New Orleans at NOLA TAC. And I'll be back there in March uh, for TAC con and then i've got uh a return trip to lakeland florida next april and next june i've got a trip to ashland kentucky and all the links for registration and class description and all that stuff are on my website all that is my my, my signature class pistol shooting solutions which is intended uh, in, in in like three or four words it's high performance concealed carry um and it's it's very much my personal it, it's almost like it's like a two-day crystallization of my journey from tactical timmy to technical timmy uh and uh, so a lot of a lot of technical skills work but very much integrated with uh where where i think the the technical and the tactical worlds best mesh and to you know to try to reunify those worlds that really don't need to be separated at all very cool you know based on everything you've been saying tonight it really sounds like you probably need to jump on facebook especially our groups <laughs> oh lord we'll discuss that here in a moment though. all right oh, lord. okay okay yeah uh, <laughs> you? yeah god knows gabe has been in enough magazines and pictures about polite society matches and everything i mean you know the cat's out of the bag, bro. bag bro. You, just yeah. gotta, you gotta embrace it now i mean <laughs> okay fair you enough. Know, uh, you know. at least instagram well, I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah in, in, insta famous you know we, we'll get you there you know we got you quick followers we got exactly. Jedi followers you're over four you're over nine thousand. no sorry bro, bro <laughs> it's a good dude hold on stand by hold on keep talking oh, let's boy. check this shit out let's check uh, this shit out with a little help from my friends exactly i, I am at speaking of instagram it looks like matthew little was following primary and secondary already Oh, so well, I messaged yeah. him, and I'm following him now. That's good. I, I'm at 4234. 4234. So, wow. Yeah, so I got, uh, I got like uh, 12, 40, 400 followers in two days. Thanks, guys. Go. Yeah, man. You know, now don't disappoint them because they'll all unsubscribe, right? <laughs> it's all good. It just did. It's all good. I'll just keep on. I'll keep on stealing your guys' shit. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> just gonna start reposting our stuff always yeah, exactly, exactly. At, at, at least gabe knows that i'm giving him credit where credit is due without completely just plagiarizing his shit so you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> hey you know i i learned i learned from people and i did not invent everything that i know I, it's, un, it's unavoidable and this is how we're going to move the human race forward is uh to all uh make the whole thing better and uh you know credit where credit is due is always a good thing and you know, I mean, that's how it's how it is. It's how it is. What are you sure. going to do? Reinvent the wheel every time? No way. Right. <clears throat> Another primary and secondary thing. <clears throat> You're a natural. <clears throat> <laughs> sh sh shoulders are giants, right? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. So I guess I guess a gear question, right? It's your turn. The, yeah. the Geardo stuff. Um, you know, it's, so yeah, I, I shoot a Beretta. Um, I was sponsored by Wilson Combat up until recently. I'm. Uh, I said I kind of just hanging it up at the national level circuit and everything, but man, Wilson Combat has been awesome. They were they were really instrumental in making the Beretta cool again uh, when they released their Brigadier Tacticals, great guns. They're kind of set up the way most people would want to set up a Beretta for competition. Having a replaceable front sight on on that gun is is really where it's at. Um, so Beretta does you know. I don't think Brenna even makes Brigadier Tactical or Brigadier Slides anymore other than the, the stuff for Wilson. I, I may be wrong about that, but um, but they've kind of cornered the market on that. Um, 
you know, Wilson's also great with their marketing and everything too. They make a great 1911. I shoot their 1911 on bullseye, um, or at least I did. I had some more time to do that, um, which, is, which is a lot of fun, actually. Good way to learn stuff. Um, they make a lot of cool go-fast parts for Beretta. So um, how should I say? Uh, sights, trigger bars, trigger springs, all that stuff that, that's really cool. I helped design a rear sight for, for the Beretta that, that most of the people who are into USPSA or, or gaming like. It's just a flat, flat sight, kind of works, nice aperture, nice nicely framing the front sight. So that, that works on their stock guns, on Beretta stock guns, as well as their, uh, their you know, kind of Brigadier Tactical where you can actually switch out the front sight. But um, so, yeah, for Beretta stuff, Wilson Combat's cool. I'll, I'll kind of plug them right away. They, they've been great, I think, for you know to me and they've been really great for the shooting sports uh you know they, they've unleashed idpa on us so um all right as far as carrying stuff um you know i've, I've been carrying a spencer keepers concealment holster i don't even know what gun it's made for um paul sharp bought it back from like the tactical conference and was like here dude you need to use this holster and i was like all right cool you know um i drilled some extra holes because i got really big hands like my hand is bigger than my head. You see that? Like, <laughs> really. I, oh wait, yeah. Anyway, um, so my hands tend to get in the way when I'm when I'm drawing the gun. So I drilled some extra holes and kicked up the ride height even more. Um, I'm a really big guy. Uh, I'm six four. Um, I am not a lanky individual either. So it, it, it you know, I don't really have any problems concealing, the, you know, a big gun like that. Um, I. I run it with like a, a wedge of some sort. They kind of wear out for me, so I, I've got a. I'm like more neoprene and, and just you know yoga pick, block. Yeah, yoga block. I might have to experiment. I don't with the yoga it's block. Yeah, it's, it's the truth. It's the absolute truth. I, I will. I will look that up. I'll. I'll um. You got to ig some of that stuff because uh, that that might that might help. Um, yeah. So th that holster has been great. Um, it's nice to have options though. So I'm, I'm kind of stoked. Dark star gear hopefully is going to do, uh, very nice. Very nice. Yeah. If you, this is to anybody, if you send Scott, your holster, Fuck he, off. Will, he will build them for you. <laughs> you uh, fuck right off. <laughs> so oh, yeah, for, uh, okay. hit me, slide in my DMS. I'll give you his address. Yeah. There, there you right. go. Yep. Uh, only 200 a pop. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> Laughing all the way to the bank. You know, that's why he's drinking Centauri. Don't don't listen to him. It's not LaCroix. But uh anyway, um <laughs> yeah, there, there you, it's got a, a dead face on it, a skull yeah. and crossbones. It's it's probably pretty good, but right. But it's uh flowery, like, flowery and dead like my soul. <laughs> but uh yeah, it's nice to have options. And, and this this has been the thing, you know, so Breta, the guns have been kind of popularized again i think there's a lot of interest in those in those pistols again so langdon of course is doing a ton with it ernest is an awesome guy uh keepers is really liking his berettas too so i get a lot of questions for him about setting it up and, and all that stuff so it, it's cool that the people are making some of the holsters for it uh dark star gear uh, you know i've kind of corresponded a little bit with them i'm i'm really hoping if anybody knows him pretty well you know kind of say hey man you know he's probably you're... watching right now tom kelly get off your ass he's important yeah and, he, and he's on primary and secondary <clears throat> right 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 um you know it's paul sharp is a beretta guy you know tom like paul's paul's into beretta so you got to make a holster for him so you can wear it with his gi pants and stuff like that so um <laughs> you know Phil Filster is another company, man. They make some really cool stuff. I wish they had a holster for the Breda. Um, I'd love to explore some of the stuff that they do with the flex system. I think that could be very cool, uh, especially having moved to some warmer climbs where where board shorts and flip flops is kind of the the operational process for the day. It's like, man, it'd be cool to just you know put some dark star you know clips on something and and go. That would be very neat. Um, so I, I'm kind of curious about that. Hopefully, hopefully some some other holster makers that are really good that I really respect their product for, like the Glock line, comes out with something for the Breda that would be cool. Um, so looking forward to that. But uh, yeah, as far as stuff to carry, I carry a gun. I, I carry a light in the pocket. I don't. My Beretta doesn't have a rail, so the one that I use, um, the gun's pretty much stock. Um, I've got a D spring in it. 
that, that's kind of stock-ish. It's a G model, so the, the decocker comes right back up. I put my own rear sight on there, and um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it's not, it's nothing special. It's like an eight pound, some change double action. It's like almost like a four and a half or five pound. I, I, it's been a while since I measured it single action. It's not, it's not like a great trigger by any stretch, but hey man, it works. It's like it's, it's Indeed not, it does. I, I don't think it's holding me back from anything. Um, you know, I just run, I don't even run night sights on it. It's just a white dot, you know, I make that joke a lot with Scott, you know, I took my white dot gun to his red dot class and did all right. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, so it, it's just the old painted white dot in the metal site and it's, hey, it, it runs. Um, you know, that's the thing, man. I think a lot of people, by the way, you know, I go out and they want to get like go fast gear and I get it. You know, the, the tinkering is, is cool and you, you want something that that is awesome and everything that's going to blow your hair back. But at the end of the day, you know, don't lose sight of the fact that, you know, putting in the effort to get better as a shooter with whatever gear you have, um, that that's really what's most important. Um, if you have something that's going to work pretty well to, you know, like a Glock 17 is good enough, get off your ass, do the work. That That's where it's at. Um, so many good choices for holsters for, for so many different guns these days. So, hey, you know, just go go and shoot. Buy that ammo, as John said, and and, uh, and and get to the range. Really, that, yep. that's that's what matters. So, yeah. yeah, I was doing my taxes from last year. It was uh, I think like twelve point like seven or something thousand mm -hmm. dollars that I spent on ammo. Wow, yeah, <laughs> yeah, too much. <laughs> yeah, but, not you know, enough. I, not enough. Not enough. Exactly in my eyes, in some people's eyes, it's too much. So, so that's a big thing. So like, I think at the, the, the peak of my competitive like stuff, which is probably like 2014, um, right before the daughter, daughter was born 2015. Um, I think I shot the most rounds then, um, you know, it was, it was about, about 40 K. I, I it wasn't especially like a high volume shooter, like, like a guy, like, you know, there, there are other guys who shoot, you know, upwards of like a hundred K. I mean, that, that's a, uh, a lot of money, a lot of time spent reloading, but, um, but that was cool. SNS bullets, you know, they, they sponsored me and they definitely gave me a break. Um, great guys. You know, there are a lot of really great bullet companies out there making coded projectiles that has really brought down the cost. And a lot of those things really work. Uh, they're all using the same, like they use they're all using the same process and the same lubricant to actually like coat the bullets. So that, that stuff is great. Um, Mark seven reloading is down in Fort Myers. They make an excellent machine. Uh, you know, it's amazing. It's like, you know, how, how has the nature of USPSA changed in, in a way? There's really two big things that I think have like influenced the game. One is video. So people can get online and watch like Gabe's videos or can watch like Ben Steger's old videos and stuff like that and really start to dissect what, what the hell they're doing and how they get that way. So there's a lot more information being exchanged. It used to be that the only place you could go was a forum like Brian Enos forums, right, to get yeah. some information for competitive shooting. Now it's huge. You know, Facebook, all the groups, um, Pistol Forum is still, like, awesome. Uh, Enos is still a good place to go for, like, some purely competitive stuff, although it's kind of turned into Geardos a lot more than, than just people actually talking about the performance aspects, which is kind of, kind of sad. But... Um, I think that's the information is out there, whether it's in video or whatever, the internet has been huge for practical shooting. And the other thing is too, is just like the, the, the drop in the prices as far as like coded projectiles and reloading presses. I mean, you get guys who've been like doing it for like two or three years and all of a sudden they've got like a, a new Mark seven, they're putting out like 2000 rounds of ammo per, per hour. And it's just like, Holy fuck. Like, you know, mm. I used to sit there and pull the goddamn handle like all the time. It's like, you know, where, where did you get the money to buy that? And can I have one? <laughs> so, but, um, that, that, that has been really cool. So a lot more people are getting to a lot more ranges and you know, to actually shoot all the ammo that they're making too. That's just, that's crazy. That's awesome. So yeah, good stuff. Cool. Yeah. Or, well, um, yeah, before I close all this up, for the panelists, don't take off yet. We'll we'll end the show, but we'll we have to talk about something before we do. 
Um, Blowers and Pressburg are going to be teaching in Northern Utah uh, in September and hopefully in October. If you're not familiar with this, check out, uh, uh, not, yeah, I guess it would be press check. And then also uh, tap rack tactical for the, for the details. I know there are a lot of Utahns and people nearby that have been asking about it and the, the classes are coming uh, both pistol classes, at least as of now, big thanks to our sponsor facts on firearms. Uh, check out factsonfirearms.com if you're looking for pistol barrels, rifle barrels, specifically AR barrels or AR parts. Um, great company, great people. Um, definitely worth uh, definitely worth your attention, especially if you're you're considering parts for a new build. Uh, also, a big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. Uh, without your support, this would be very difficult to maintain. We have so many cogs in the big machine. Uh, so many avenues that primary and secondary is operating on and uh, your support is greatly appreciated. So thank you. Um, if you're interested in helping support the network, go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary. And from there, you can basically help support the network. Uh, we have uh, monthly support going from a dollar monthly to sky's the limit. And for each level, our, uh, it, it provides different perks. Speaking of these perks, I am going to be doing another... Um, used 870 police short barrel shotgun as soon as we reach uh, 700 patrons i'll do the drawing if you're a patreon subscriber you're automatically entered the higher the tier you are the more entries you have if you happen to live in an area where you cannot own one of those we'll find something to replace it basically the way it works is i supply the shotgun you you pay the uh the tax stamp so let's see here. Yeah, you can find us at primaryandsecondary.com. We have a forum on primaryandsecondary.com slash forum. Um, we have a ton of Facebook groups. Not only that, but we're even on Twitch under a different different title. And you'll find that under, uh, if you go to primaryandsecondary.com, look under resources on the left-hand side. Um, we are on Spreaker, iTunes, Vimeo, Google, iHeartRadio, all kinds of places. Hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed this. I sure did. Um, be sure to like, subscribe, share, all that kind of stuff. It, it definitely helps us out. And I strongly suspect some of the discussion here will be able to help a lot of, a lot of people. So great stuff. Um, thanks to the panel for, for joining us. Great discussion. Um, I would not be surprised if every single panelist here winds up coming back for a further discussion. Um, Next week's show, expect a live show on Thursday, 1800 hours Mountain Standard Time. Uh, yeah, my work schedule is allowing me to continue that, that schedule for now. When it changes, I'll, I'll let you guys know. So until then, talk to you guys later.